let me call the meeting to order. Mr. Warren, would you please? Uh, Director Reed? Here. Gunther? Here. Kohler? Here. Zeppi? Here. And Huang? Here. With that, salute to the flag. Director Kohler, would you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, next we have public comments. Members of the public may address the board on any issue not listed on the agenda which are within the purview of the Alameda <coughs> County Water District. Members of the public who wish to address the board on a scheduled agenda item should approach the speaker's podium at the time the item is introduced. So would any member of the public who wish to address the board? Thank you. Um, may, you may I ask you to introduce yourself and you have three minutes. My name is Karen Garza, uh, Fremont resident. A mm -hmm. um, couple things. Um, obviously, we're in a drought. Um, and my issue is that um, I'm being charged for using 280,000 gallons of water in two months. Um, I escalated this. Uh, after three months, they've been able to replace my meter. I've read reports after reports after reports throughout the country that there's been faulty meters. I have tried to prove that there's no way that my 851 square foot house with one bathroom could we use 280,000 gallons of water. And I do not find it fun to just run three or four of my faucets 24 seven just because. So I am hoping to have an answer from your panel, hopefully within the next week or so, um, to find out if uh, I, you guys don't adjust my bill, I need to take um, further action. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your comment. Uh, I just might add that um, that customer's meter uh, was pulled and it will be tested in our meter testing shop tomorrow and there is an opportunity for the customer to witness the meter test. Um, I believe the Garza's have declined. I would, you would know what to look for. Okay. Um, you're, you're most certainly welcome to uh, witness the test and our technician will show you exactly what they're doing. Um, and then we'll see, because we're just as perplexed. Uh, uh, the Garza's have indicated that they, are, that they have no, um, no indication of any leaks and we're just as perplexed uh, as they are. So uh, we'll do that. We'll see what the test results are, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Any other? Sorry, what time is uh, we can coordinate that with your schedule. Uh, would you like us to contact you? Sure. OK. Um, Madam President, uh, just a point of order. Is the public microphone on? I'm concerned about the audio because it sounded kind of weak. It, it sounds like it's on Director Steffi. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can hear your voice through the speaker. All right. Okay. Thank you. Any other members of the public that wish to address the board? Ms. Ramos. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gregory Lemos, and I live at uh, 5788 uh, Dicondra Place in Newark. And um, I have a lot of comments that might uh, be put on your plate. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the managers. Uh, I don't see Mr. Uh, Peterson, but uh, the gate that I talked about a couple of uh, sessions ago, mm -hmm. uh, it's been locked and secured properly. And I had contacted uh, San Francisco Water about posting signs. They have put a no trespassing or loitering sign by law. And uh, my comments are many and vague, so please bear with me. Three minutes, uh, please. Say, uh, municipal utility is scrapping its 25% surcharge, and they're giving up millions of dollars 
by doing that. But yet, uh, ACWD is uh, actually increasing our uh, usage. Uh, so I just say, hum, I don't know. Uh, my wife doesn't like the taste of uh, the ACWD water and uh, won't drink it. And that means I have to go out and buy those cases of water or, or that uh, purified water. It's a little hassle for myself. I don't know what can be done. Uh, the only thing I've heard of is the chlorination. They're using chloramine instead of uh, chlorine. And that might make a difference in the taste of the water. I really don't know. I drink it. I don't know. But anyway, my wife has to be pampered. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, also, uh, maybe you can address in maybe your next letter, uh, Mr. Uh, Shaver, on the, these things that have been coming up, like the Calaveras and lo uh, Los Vaqueros uh, and the uh, semi-tropic uh, stored water. Uh, I don't know how it affects the, this water company or if at all. Uh, but a uh, couple of people I talked to was wondering about that. And uh, next is uh, the meter boxes, where your meters are. Uh, I noticed uh, some of them being de de deteriorating and broken. And people that are walking in the street don't necessarily walk on those uh, uh, coverings. 30 seconds, Mr. Limo. Thank you. Uh, and then, of course, uh, measure AA. I don't know how it affects the water company, but uh, PG&E is giving $250,000 to it. And, of course, California needs more water storage. What is ACW do, doing for it? Uh, what I'm talking about on the uh, covering, I went out and used my wife's camera, and we were able to get these pictures. So you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, the time stops are, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much and, okay. yeah, please. Sounds good, sure. Thank you. Do I have any other members of the public wish, who wish to address the board? All right, hearing none, I believe your manager has a couple comments and corrections. Um, yes, uh, one, one announcement. Um, as the board is aware, um, this is our first board meeting that is being videoed and will be available on our website. Um, this was done in response to a board directive. And when you see the red light on over there, uh, we are being watched. And just wanted to remind that and remind the board of that issue. Um, when we are ready to address the consent calendar, I do have some remarks, but I think we are going to um, <coughs> yeah. address a different item on the agenda. Yes. So with the consent of the board, I would actually like to move item 5.9 up before the consent calendar since our special guests are all here and we don't want to force them to sit through some rather dry presentations. So with that. So uh, the month of May is Water Awareness Month. And our com community affairs specialist, Shireen Gonzalez, um, has a brief presentation and a guest to introduce the board to this evening. Thank you. Good evening, board, staff, and members of the public. It's great that tonight not only will we recognize May as Water Awareness Month, but we also have a young scientist with us who has studied water quality and purification. Each year, ACWD, along with other water and wastewater utilities in Alameda County, we host the, or sponsor the Alameda County Science and Engineering Fair. And I'm excited to report that this year there were 689 students who participated. So this evening, we will present the Excellence and Water Research Award to the second place winner in the junior category, who is Twisha Kurlagonda. In a moment, I'd like to invite Twisha up, who is an eighth grader at Horner Junior High School and she'll tell us a little bit about her, her award-winning project. Twisha? Thank 
Thank you. My name is Fisha Kalagunda, and I would first like to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to be here. Um, my project is a study of the analysis of the factors affecting a Fresnel lens and water evaporation. For my project, my goal was to bring, build a final prototype of a structure that could purify water. Due to research, I have realized that water, um, that water problems are one of the greatest problems in this society. Um, during my last project, which was solar water, which was um, which was a solar project to work on environmental problems, I was analyzing the factors that affect a solar panel. Um, I have realized that when uh, when I was performing the experiments, the mirror that I had set up was burning the box that was next to it. I decided to use this power to help others, and so I have formed this project. My project is basically to build a to find the factors that affect the sol this water distillation using a Fresnel lens, so I can build a final prototype to help people in many places without clean water. Um, my first few factors that I've analyzed was that the tilt uh, was that the tilt of the Fresnel lens could greatly vary the the distillation power of this solar panel. The other I found out that the use of mirrors could also help increase the amount of water evaporated and the tilt of the Fresnel lens and the volume of the water heated. I decided to test my theory out if these factors really did affect the distillation of solar water. To perform these experiments, I used 16 containers to hold water, four metal containers, four black containers, four white containers, and four clear glass containers. I wanted to see which of these materials would help speed up this process the most. I also built four um, I also built twelve wooden structures to hold the Fresnel lenses and test this experiment out, as you can see in the picture shown. Um, in order to per for, um, in order to perform these experiments, I built a wooden stand to hold the Fresnel lens using materials from Home Depot. I glued the structures together and placed them right next to each other at the Warm Springs Park. I then conducted my experiments over there. In the first set of experiments, I placed the same amount of water in different cups to see which material would be best to help the solar with distillation product. I found out that the metal container was the best as I expected, and the least effective of them all was the white, which would reflect light rather than ex absorb it. In the second set of experiments, I, bu I built a reflective container in which I placed the cups in. I wanted to see if this would help the process and if it would be helpful in my final prototype. I found out that this reflective surface had helped a lot and it would increase the volume. It increased the water evaporated um, exponentially. In the third study, I placed cups of different volumes to see if, this experiment, if the volumes of the water affected the evaporation rate, but surprisingly the data wasn't very clear. Even when I placed larger amount, larger amount of volume, the data wasn't very clear as you can see in these graphs. And some experiments that the, um, the, the cup with the medium amount of water placed would sometimes be greater and in other experiments it would be less. But it was constantly shown that the one with the least volume would be the greatest. And in the final studies, I used Jenga blocks to move the structures up and down to see if the tilts of the Fresnel lens affected the evaporation rate. I found out that the tilt greatly, ex greatly affected the evaporation rate and the, the because as the tilt moved higher, the Fresnel, the Fresnel lens, the focal point, got closer to the center, which caused more water to be evaporated. Thus, using this data, I had finally made a final prototype. My final prototype is drawn in the bottom. It's going to be a complete structure with a layer of Fresnel lenses at the top to hit the, to hit, let the sun hit all at all angles of the Fresnel lenses at any point of time. That was because we. If we had decided to build a structure that moves along with the sun, the water, the um, it would become too expensive, and I was planning on giving this out to people with, who cannot afford this structure. Um, then I had decided to place a reflective uh, material at the bottom of this structure to help increase the evaporation rate. Then the rope, with the pipe leading the water would go upwards, only allowing the evaporated water to go through, and then the final. And then it would go into the final container, which the water would be settled and able to drink. Wow, that's impressive.
Thank you. And since this is Water Awareness Month, um, a little additional background. The governor of California has proclaimed the month of May as Water Awareness Month. For the past 26 years, the district has been a campaign sponsor, which focuses on educating Californians about the importance of water in all facets of their lives by encouraging involvement in water awareness activities on both a local and regional level. So the recommendation is by motion, adopt the resolution proclaiming the month of May as Water Awareness Month. Do I have a motion from the board? I so moved. Second? <coughs> I'll second. Director is Weed. Aye. Gunther? Aye. Kohler? Aye. Bethy? Aye. And Huang? Aye. With that, let's go back to our original agenda order. Let's move on to consent calendar. I'll move the consent calendar. Uh, modification uh, of the consent calendar? Well, with the, ex uh, I can move all but item 4.5, which I have a conflict of interest in, and I'll have to So, how many, uh, so I, I, I believe you would like to remove item 4.5 well, okay. from. I will remove item 4.5 from the consent calendar. Do motion. you wish to add any other items? And. We can add items 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7, 5.8 to the consent calendar. And if I, if I may, Director Wong, just wanted to let the board know that in, on item 4.3, uh, there are a couple of typos for the fiscal year on the resolution document itself. Uh, that's been corrected and will be um, the resolution that gets signed. Correct. Yeah, so I okay. uh, just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. Do I have a second? I'll go ahead and second. Okay. As amended. Okay, Director Zweed? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Kohler? Aye. Bethy? Aye. And Huang? Aye. Do I have a motion to accept the consent calendar as amended? I'll move as amended. I'll second the motion. Okay. Director Zweed? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Kohler? Aye. Bethy? Aye. And Huang? Aye. So let's move on to and, and just uh, yeah. just for it's going to sound ridiculous, but I think Director Weed should actually leave the room. Yes, no, I, I will. I just want to explain very briefly that I have on a property with that. So this is a large parcel which is being under consideration. A corner of the parcel was within 500 feet of the property that I own. So with that, Director Weed, please. Leafy, and we have someone that will go retrieve Director Weed when we finish with the item. Yes? And I believe regarding item 4.5, Mr. Stevenson has one uh, brief comment. Yeah, that's just to make sure the board's aware of an error in the board packet. There are two copies of Exhibit B for that one public water system extension agreement. The first copy is not correct. It shouldn't be in the packet. The second copy is what is included in the agreement itself. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Right. Not Hold yet. on. Not no, yet. Get, <laughs> 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 oh, This is great. First day we're recording this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so with that, <laughs> Any other staff presentation, or if that's it, then do I have a motion to accept staff recommendation? I'll make, I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommendation on item 4.5. Second? I'll second it. Directors Weed, Gunther? Aye. Fuller? Aye. Bethy? Aye. And Juan? Aye. Would somebody please go retrieve Director Weed? Thank you. He was sent off for some quiet time. So. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> Be nice. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> All right. So our next item is a presentation on OPEB actuarial reviews. Yes, and 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, this presentation will be performed by John Bartell, and I'm looking at Lynn Lan, our acting finance manager, to see if there are additional comments that she would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. John Bartell from Bartell & Associates. Mr. Bartell is the president of the firm and he specializes in actuary services. He has over 30 years of experience in employee benefits valuation and he has been our OPEB actuary for, the, for over 10 years. Um, today he will be reviewing the district's OPEB valuation report with the board. Uh, please join me in welcoming him here, Mr. Bartell. So while, uh, while that's coming up, uh, let me just say I do my best to try to remember to say this every time I speak to a council or a board, uh, Madam President, members of the board, it is absolutely uh, my honor to be speaking to you on, on this topic. So uh, we're proud to uh, be the district's uh, actuarial consultant for um, retiree health care issues. Uh, what I have is a uh, presentation to go over the uh, result. I'm going to go through some of these slides with your uh, permission relatively quickly. Having said that, um, uh, again, um, Madam President, if it's okay with you, I would like to encourage board members to ask questions as we go. I think it'll be uh, easier for me to answer if we do that, and it might be uh, better for the uh, board members as well. Um, so uh, just very, very, very quickly, uh, we'll start out on uh, uh, slide one with uh, just a little bit of history. I'm going to go over this very, very quickly. Uh, uh, Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement number 45 is an accounting standard uh, that uh, requires the district to recognize uh, retiree health care other than post and other than pensions, post-employment benefits, uh, as uh, services being rendered by uh, employees. So um, the um, uh, accounting standard was issued in uh, 2004. The district implemented the new accounting standard in 89, and now that we're all used to that accounting standard, we have a new one coming up that will be effective for the 17-18 uh, fiscal year. I have a slide towards the back uh, about that new accounting standard. So slide two, uh, definition of terms. I'm actually going to uh, skip over this slide as we get to the terminology, as we get to the numbers, I'm gonna define the terms, but if you wanna refer back to what I'm talking about, you can, you can certainly do so. Um, the uh, uh, district has a benefit that varies based on when people were hired. So if you were hired before, August 1st of 2002, you get the uh, highest cost HMO or purse choice benefit and, and there was no uh, uh, vesting or no uh, uh, service requirement to be eligible for that benefit. If you were hired from August 1st of 2002 through or, or through the end of uh, uh, 2008, you got the same benefit but but there was a service requirement. You had to work uh, 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 a certain service requirement to be eligible for the benefit. At 20 years of service, you got 100% of that benefit. And then for folks hired on or after January 1 of 09, the uh, cap was lowered to the uh, uh, Bay Area lowest cost HMO or PERS choice. Uh, and so it went from the highest to the lowest and then the service requirement was extended to uh, 25 years of service to be eligible for, uh, uh, for the benefit. Relatively low dental benefit that was provided for folks hired by and large on or after uh, January of 2009, no dental uh, uh, or vision benefit, very so, um, a little bit based upon the uh, uh, bargaining group. Uh, so that's really a summary of the, of the benefits. The uh, slide five goes through the summary of the uh, demographic information that we gathered to calculate our liabilities. So you have 209 active employees, 
We've prepared our calculation as of June 30, 2015. 290, excuse me, 209 active employees at that time. You had 192 retirees. So you're approaching the point where you have almost as many folks receiving uh, the benefit as you do active employees. Slide, slide six goes through my favorite slide, the uh, methods and assumptions. The key assumptions I'll really point out here, the single biggest assumption is the long-term assumption of what your uh, assets will earn. You all are pre-funding through uh, CalPERS Trust. We have a long-term assumption for that of uh, seven and a quarter. Uh, you might note we're preparing a June 30, 15 valuation, but determining your contribution <coughs> requirement for the 16, 17, and 17, 18 fiscal years. So we take the assets, the available information that we had at June 30, 15, and we roll that forward to June 30, 16. We're also providing sensitivity uh, at the uh, district's request at lower discount rates. What would the, what would the results be if we uh, used a 5% or a 5 and 3 quarters discount rather than the 7 and a quarter? Uh, and so to do that, we uh, started out with, uh, on slide seven, uh, a little bit of history of the, um, uh, of, of the assets. You, in, in, uh, uh, at June 30, 15, you all have about 15, a little bit less than that, $15 million uh, set aside against your liabilities. If you look at that bottom row there, the rate of return, uh, you might note, because of the way the assets are invested is uh, relatively volatile, poor investment returns in those first two years, very, very good in the next two, and then June 30, 15, the investment return, negative 0 0.3. I'll just mention you're on track for the current fiscal year to have another poor investment return. That's kind of the nature of, um, of this um, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, good years followed by bad years, if, if you will. Um, and in fact, at slide eight, what we do is we don't use the market value of assets to determine your contribution rate or funded status. We use what we refer to as an actuarial value of assets. That's really a recognition of about a fifth of the gains and losses uh, each year. So if we, at June 30, 15, market value was 14,765. The actuarial value at June 30, 15, 15 uh, million, slightly above that because we had more uh, investment losses. Anytime you have more investment losses, you have losses that, that you're waiting to recognize. The other way around, would mean uh, you would have gains. We expect the um, actuarial value to be uh, slightly above the market value in the next valuation as well. Then if we look at slide nine, slide nine shows um, at June 30, 15, a total actuarial liability. That is the value of benefits based on service that's been rendered. So in the interest of full disclosure, for me, my target is for you all to down the road have assets equal to that $51 million number. I think of 100% um, funding target as a very good target. That's actually the way we're determining your, your contribution. So you had $51 million liability at June 30, 15, we had an actuarial value of 15 million, so you had an unfunded liability of 36 million dollars. Uh, if, if we go back to the prior valuation, you had a 20% funded ratio. That is, if you take your um, um, assets and divide that by liabilities, and that number has really grown over that period of time, we're projecting at June 30, 16, you to have about a 33% funded ratio. 
given that you have only been funding for a short period of time, we look at that as uh, very nice progress towards uh, uh, a funded status. You can kind of see that graphically. We would certainly expect that that would uh, uh, continue. And then from a contribution standpoint, we had a small net gain. So your 15, 16, the current fiscal year contribution, <coughs> 4 million 079. Next year, the contribution requirement would be a little bit lower, 3 million 972, uh, increasing we prepare your calculation, uh, your contribution as a uh, level percentage of pay. We're expecting your payroll to go up, so then the contribution would go up. And you can see as a percentage of pay, it's dropped from 17.1 to 16.2 percent, a modest reduction. And. Um, then for uh, discount rate sensitivity, using a uh, seven and a quarter, uh, that $36 million number from the unfunded liability from the previous slide, if we were using a five and three quarters discount rate, that would increase to 46.7 million. Let me just stop for a moment. Um, the nature of the actuarial liability is it really represents the portion of the benefits not provided by investment earnings. So if we think the in earnings are going to be lower, then the portion of the benefits, the benefits aren't going to change, but the portion provided by contribution have to go up. So the actuarial liability would increase about $10 million and similarly, the unfunded liability would increase by 10. And if we had a 5% uh, discount rate, goes up again another uh, $06.5 million. So the unfunded liability would be 53.5 million. Contribution rate at the uh, recommended discount rate, 16.2 at five and three quarters that would increase to 22.2 and at 5 to 25.8% of pay. So slide 13 uh, talks about the uh, counting changes coming up. Uh, you all might remember that the, uh, your, your CalPERS pension benefits are now uh, being accounted for under GASB 68, uh, GASB 75, that accounting standard is sort of the cousin to 68. So you now have your unfunded pension liability uh, on the face of your financial statement. Your OPEB will be moving to the face of your financial statement, replacing uh, statement 45 for the 17-18 uh, fiscal year. That unfunded liability um, will probably be lower than what we uh, are showing now uh, because the district is assumed to make contributions. Having said that, for agencies that are not pre-funding their obligation or are not paying the full required contribution, they will need to use a 20-year high quality municipal bond rate to determine that. Um, that today is in the low, uh, it's about three and a quarter uh, uh, percent. Uh, and, uh, but uh, because the district um, continues to prefund the obligation, we would anticipate using a seven and a quarter discount rate. So the numbers you saw on the previous slide, if you were implementing that, that's that unfunded liability is what would be on the face of your financial statement. I can, I'd be happy to keep talking. I can probably <coughs> talk about this as long as you all can uh, talk <coughs> about water issues. So before I open the question up to the board, I would like to see if anybody in the audience has a question. No? Hearing none, the board, Director Seppi? Yes. Um, Thank you very much, John, for your presentation. Um, I don't have any questions, but I do have a few comments for the board and the public. 
Um, the first comment is that um, my tenure on the board began in 2010, and uh, you've gone back to 2010 here on your data that you're providing. Um, being on the finance committee that entire period and chairing it, um, I'm really pleased that the district has and the board have um, made the necessary contributions to get us from four and a half million uh, pre-funded up to about 15 million, including the returns that we, of course, received. So that's good progress, as you mentioned. Um, number two, <coughs> um, I mentioned in our last finance meeting where you presented that we have a number of um, real property sales that may be occurring in the next fiscal year or two. And uh, it would be my recommendation to our board that we use those proceeds from those property sales to um, further prepay our indebtedness here. Um, it may be a little controversial. I will recommend bringing something formal to the board at the appropriate time uh, when we have those sales uh, uh, occurring. Um, but I feel very strongly about this, that many public entities have real property sales and end up using the money to finance operations or brand new facilities. Um, which I call the um, uh, a, a disuse of public funds, really. Um, I think that there's a primary obligation to pay down unfunded liabilities first. So um, if we had, for instance, a $5 million sale on real property, you know, I would recommend that we prepay down, down here. The last point is <coughs> on the discount rate sensitivity analysis that you conducted. Historically, CalPERS has used about a 7.5% um, uh, investment return rate. Uh, it's been lowered to 7.25%. I still believe that 7.25% is too high of uh, a return rate being forecasted annually forward. I believe that this is being done primarily for public consumption to lower uh, the estimates of, of obligations to uh, unfunded liabilities. And I believe that our district is actu actually um, more exposed than the 61 million that we're looking at right now. And it's probably closer to 10 or $20 million more, which is why I've further believe that any opportunity that we have to pay down unfunded liabilities with one-time uh, revenues that come into the district is probably the most prudent uh, course for us. So those are my three comments. Thank you. Director Kohler? No comment. Director Gunther? Um, I, don't a, I don't have a comment. I, I, I do appreciate Director Sethi's ideas and we'll look forward to those in the future. Director Wee? Yes, I'll find Mrs. Saint. <coughs> I think it's important to realize in your discussions we're talking about net present value. So that is the actual amount we owe as of today, assuming these discount rates. The assumption that we're going to have a 7.25% return on our investments each year compounding for the next 20 years, I believe is overly optimistic and hopefully over time we'll be able to put that down. Um, in addition to the unfunded liability we have here, which is running about $35 million in that present value, we also have our retirement, our CalPERS. This is only for the medical benefits for those who are watching. And there, by going from 7.5 to 6.5 on discount rate on part of CalPERS, we're seeing our unfunded net present value going, liability going from $64 million to $94 million. Mm -hmm. Add this on top of it, we're at about $130 million net present value unfunded, well over our annual budget that we have to recover. I, um, one is a minor technical, I would hope we could arrange for um, that we 
a clear and simplified version that we will have these paid up by a certain date at a certain pay rate. Currently, we're a little over 20 years is our projected uh, rate of return. That if we do an accelerated rate, we look at an accelerated rate, as you noted, to 100% rather than 80% because we can always modify it as we get closer. So this is a long-term obligation we have. The and in comparison, it's my understanding that in the private sector, they're using their the IRS is allowing 4.4% as their investment rate of return uh, for corporations. Only in the public sector do we able to stretch it out um, to a far more optimistic uh, objective. So over time, hopefully we'll work it out. Um, the last two years, this year, we'll see it's the second year in a row that we'll probably be negative on our returns following two very good years. But overall, it appears that the markets are stabilizing, going more horizontal. We're not seeing these rapid rates, and we're going to see a major hit. <coughs> right now, given our current drop in revenues and water sales, it's going to be difficult to address it. And I do endorse Director Sethi's suggestion that we look at uh, real estate sales as a way to help pay off this real obligation. Thank you, Director Wee. Director Kohler? Yes, I'd like to back up, and uh, for the for the record, I'd like to uh, the public to know that under GASB 45, John, um, we had options of of having a 30-year plan, right? And then we, but the board adopted a 20-year plan to pay well, this down. It, if so you look at a, a more responsible approach, what what, um, what the board adopted originally was 30 years, but there's 24 left of the original unfunded. Okay. So you've got 24 left. And what we also have is changes that have occurred from the original 30-year period are being each amortized over their own 15-year period. So um, what uh, Director Weed, I think, was suggesting was that we combine all those bases into a single base with a single amortization period to make it easier to, uh, I, am I right? Yes, yes, to, exactly. to make it a little bit yeah. easier for people to get their, their head around. We, we could, we, we have clients who do it both ways and we would, we, we would certainly not object to uh, amortizing everything over a single 20 year period. Okay. Uh, as long as the 20-year period decreased, uh, so you go for 20, 19, 18, mm -hmm. uh, we, we certainly would not uh, object to that. We wouldn't object to doing everything over 24 and then having it go 23, 22. I, in any of those, we think is perfectly reasonable. Okay. Yeah, one of the very positive changes of Gatsby was districts had traditionally just had the rolling 30 years. So they just okay. here each yeah. year, yeah. You, you were never catching up. Now they've actually set a date that you have to uh, pay the bill. Yeah. Thank you, Director Weed. And as for myself, the thing is clear that is the unfunded liability is an issue that the board really wants to address. But we are also balancing it with rate increases. We really do not want to impact our customers that much. So I think Director Sethi's idea is really outside the box, and I think it's actually really good to use these type of one-time income, such as property sale, to offset our liability. So thank you for that suggestion, and thank you, Mr. Bartell. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So <coughs> with that, let's move on to item 510, please. Yes, thank you, Madam President. 510 involves a resolution for exception to the 180-day wait period certifying the appointment of a retired annuitant to a limited-term critically needed position. And our manager of operations and maintenance, Steve Peterson, is on vacation. So covering for Mr. Peterson this evening is our distribution maintenance division manager, Mr. Robert Ells, who will summarize this item and provide a recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Uh, the district is currently conducting recruitment to fill the emergency response and security offer, officer, which is called URSO position. This is a new position authorized by the board at its February 11, 2016 board meeting and replaces the position of health and safety supervisor, resulting in a no net change in the number of positions authorized by the board. 
The recruitment process is expected to be completed and the selected candidate on board no later than the end of May of 2016. Because of this critical nature and the responsibilities of the URSO position, staff recommends hiring Steve Dennis, a, rec a recently retired district employee whose responsibilities included emergency response and security for a limited term to provide critical training, orientation, and background information to the new employee on the district's various emergency response and security programs, multiple alarm notifications, and security patrol uh, contracts on its district's emergency business continuity plan. Mr. Dennis will provide extra help needed in these critical safety areas during this limited duration employment. Staff plans to hire Mr. Dennis as a retired annuitant from July 11th to November 10th of 2016. Mr. Dennis will be paid within the established salary range for the emergency response and security officer at the rate identified in the attached resolution. Mr. Dennis retired from the district service uh, effective February 19th of 2016 and has met the requirements for the bona fide separation period of 60 days or more as required due to his retirement under the normal retirement age. However, as staff plans to rehire Mr. Dennis on July 11, 2016, which is prior to the end of the 180-day wait list period required by statute, a board resolution is necessary to certify the appointment of the retired annuitant to a limited term critical needed position. There is adequate funding in the budget for this expenditure, so the recommendation is by motion, approve the resolution, a resolution for the exception to the 100-day wait period certifying the appointment of Steve Dennis, a retired annuitant, to a limited term critically needed position performing special project work associated with the district's emergency response and security related programs. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Do we have any questions from members of the public? No? Questions or, and or comments from the directors? No comments. Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept staff recommendation? I'll move staff recommendation. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Directors Weed? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Kohler? Aye. Sethi? Aye. And Huang? Aye. <coughs> With that, that's me to report. Does any member, uh, any directors have comments on item six, list under 6.1, the board committee reports? I have one short comment, please. Director Sethi? On the legal and legislative meeting report, um, was attached all of the legislation that's um, before the legislature on uh, water issues, water related issues. Um, the 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 attachment that Mr. Davis prepares for the committee includes bills that are related to water, uh, but maybe not necessarily all bills, um, but but we do capture most of them and bills that otherwise ACWD might have an interest in. Right. So I have a request for Mr. Davis, who is our lobbyist in Sacramento, <coughs> that um, at the end of each uh, bill summary, there's a, uh, a notation for position on the bill. But um, for the most part, um, it's left blank. And I really would appreciate it as a board member if um, we we had some direction from Mr. Davis, uh, even if it's very general, positive, negative, or neutral, something like that, on on the bills. Because otherwise, we as board members have to go back and research that bill, and uh, we're not all lawyers here, so it's very confusing to actually figure out with all the competing bills. Um, where do we as a district stand on these things? Uh, and it seems like everything is left blank, and that's the only encouragement I'd like to give us. So one of the challenging aspects of dealing with the legislative session is it moves very quickly. And uh, for the most part, the district does not take a formal position. Um, and your general manager frequently uh, needs to step in front ahead of the board for the district to take a position on a bill. So um, for the most part, our interests are served by being represented by ACWA. Mm -hmm. However, when our, and Mr. Davis is a representative on Region 5, uh, the ACWA State Legislative Committee. 
So uh, for the most part, uh, Mr. Davis briefs me of any bills of concern, and if, um, if the district or if I'm interested in ACWD taking a position, um, I do my best to uh, let the board know. In fact, uh, we have uh, a bill under general manager's reports uh, that we <laughs> are asking to support, and uh, we do have a brief limited amount of time. They wanted our answer today, as a matter of fact, but I said, well, let's get through our board meeting. I'd love to hear if the board has any concerns about this. This is one of the most challenging parts of my job, actually, uh, to determine uh, when we should step in, it, it, when we should take a position. 99% um, of the time, our interests are in line uh, with Aqua. Occasionally, our interests differ, and that's when we tend to, um, to, to, to get ourselves into the process. So Mr. Davis is there um, tracking these bills. He provides briefings to the committee um, where the committee gets to ask questions, um, but even by then, frequently the um, summary is a little bit out of date. So um, I think what I'm saying is I'm open to suggestions. I will talk to Ron to see if there is something that we can do um, to at least, uh, for the record, show if the district has taken a position. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we, we will not. Does that make sense? Well, to a certain extent, but I, I, I would like it if there was some way to just in a general way know whether this is something positive for the water industry or, or negative. It doesn't have to be an official ACWD position. Mm -hmm. um, there is a uh, California Special Districts Association Legislative Days, two days occurring next week. Mm -hmm where they're covering a number of these bills. Um, and CSDA has taken positions on a number of them. Right. But um, for the record that we have, it's always kind of like a blank slate. There's, there's nothing there to indicate to a director or the public, is, is this something good or bad? Or right, so, and so as we go through the legislative session, uh, you will see these reports begin to take positions. You'll see some of them say watch. Some of them will say not favor or uh, support if amended. And we're still relatively early in the process and the, the bills are still morphing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still changing. They're still being amended in committee. Um, so as we get through the process, um, further and as it looks like it's going to get through the legislature, it, they crystallize in terms of what they are going to be. Right. And then that's the time where uh, generally you'll see, if you look at these reports, um, the aqua position. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will typically be how we feel about it. I, I do understand <laughs> the, the shell game that goes on where some of these uh, uh, bills are changed at the very last minute. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, there can be a bill that's about topic A, and uh, at the final hour, almost 24 hours before the bill gets voted on, it will turn into a completely different bill. It's something that if local agencies did, uh, the state would want to do something about, frankly. So, so how about here's my suggestion. We'll look at it at a legal and legislative <coughs> committee. I think even with the bill that's morphing in flux, I think most likely what we, you will see in terms of position would be neutral or watch. If that's okay with you, and then we'll get a more detailed support or against once it's more crystallized, if that's okay, then that's something I think the legal and legislative committee could talk about seeing how we could do this. Right. We probably have to put a date down and saying this is our position as of the state with yeah. the bill is presented as the state. Mm -hmm. But we could work on that. All right? Agreed. The, the one complication of that uh, under legal legend, uh, the contract with Ron Davis is that we're asking more service from him than what we're... It might be something we have to do in-house. Yes. So we, we need to, that's something that we need to talk about. 
because yeah. once in a while he wants our sense in terms of support against he will give us a recommendation, but it's our final decision. So we could talk about that in terms of labor and who does what. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good. All right. So with with that, any other comments on items under 6.1? No. If not, how about item 6. Point, any reports under 6.2, operational reports? No. Hearing none, 6.3, staff presentations, please. Yes, thank you, Madam President. We have two presentations planned for the board this evening. The first will be on the customer assistance program survey, and that presentation will be given by our customer services manager, uh, Barry Carlson. Madam President, members of the board, it's good to be back behind the podium. So uh, we have a nice little presentation about our uh, customer assistance program. And uh, well Andy's getting that fired up. Uh, finance department has been working with the uh, F&O committee on, on putting together the uh, customer assistance program. And we've made some progress on that. So we wanted to update the entire board on uh, our status of the program itself. Thank you, Andy. Okay, so our speaking points. Uh, what I wanted to cover tonight is the upcoming survey card, uh, then uh, the board director's uh, consideration. We'll talk about that the actual timing of the program, uh, the website, where are we at with the website right now with the program, and then lastly, uh, we have a little uh, assignment for the board uh, in selecting a program name. So we kind of want to brand this thing, uh, give it its, its, its own uh, image. So the customer survey, uh, survey card, uh, we're looking to insert that into our bills only for the residential customers. Uh, during our June-July billing cycle. Uh, then through the month of June and July, it'll bleed into August, we'll be receiving the input from those survey cards. And then after that, uh, staff will be able to estimate the participation and funding levels of, um, of our customers. Uh, we wanted to include an actual copy of the draft survey card as it stands right now. You can see there it, it addresses what it is, that being the customer assistance program, uh, that it's in development. This survey card is going out to our customers to say, hey, uh, we're considering uh, moving forward with a customer assistance program. Are you interested? Uh, would you qualify? Here's kind of some of the, the outlines of that. And please give us some input. I think the, uh, the key with this, this survey card right here, if you look at the bottom, uh, where it says send future updates about the program, they can check off yes or no. I think that will really help us keep integrity within the program. So those folks that are interested, we will be able to follow up with them. Clarification. Right. Well yeah. Uh, Kohler. Is this is not going to be an open card that they'll mail back to us, correct? Yes. This this card is actually are we putting an envelope? Yeah, the card is going to be inserted into an envelope. Into an envelope, okay, yeah. because I, that's that's kind of confidential information. That's yeah. I, I don't want that going through the post office with. Right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, it's my understanding. Well, my understanding that the, the only the individuals who are currently certified as being on a lifeline rate with another utility would qualify for the uh, discount, correct? They will qualify if they meet that table there, within there. Uh, we can also go off of the PG&E guidelines is what we were planning on doing, which is if a customer is already in the PG&E CARES program, then they can qualify for that as well. Uh, but typically, I think most customers that we that will receive input from will already be in the PG&E CARES program. Uh, that's this one. So again, it goes back to my understanding that we were not going to go into the business of certifying individuals. We were to rely only on another entity to be able to certify whether they were um, eligible for the program. Correct. 
and I believe at the bottom of that table, and excuse me, I can't read that fine print, but I believe that's what it goes off of. And I, I might go to legal on this one, but I believe that's what we were planning on because we we pretty much took this from what we already did with the uh, low-income conservation program that we did. We went off the same guidelines as that. But I don't see that reference to the, that you have to qualify, that we'll consider individuals who've already qualified under the PG&E guidance. Yeah. That greatly <coughs> narrows the population <coughs> to, a, not 80, uh, well, probably, I assume about 70,000 um, customers down to maybe a couple of thousand customers at most. Mm -hmm. And I would think it would be helpful to have that recognition on the survey card. This, and it's another problem I have with putting it as an insert into all of our customers. If the population is limited to the individuals who are currently in the PG&E, why not have ask PG&E to make that an insert so that we only mail the card to those who would be eligible? Right, and we actually did we did follow up on that. Uh, that I believe that came up in the FNO committee, the question of um, getting that information from PG&E. And we did make a request through of PG&E, and they were not willing to share that information. Although they did give us totals of, okay. of uh, folks that participate in the PG&E care program in the Tri-City yeah, area. I'm not suggesting that we do the mailing for them, but that they would include our information in their local and their billings to the area. Then I think that would be helpful. Then they would not have to share that with us. But what were the numbers from PG&E of the total number of people that are on their lifeline right now? Uh, their numbers pretty much were, if I recall correctly, matched the uh, the numbers that we did when we uh, did an estimate of the low-income folks uh, using, uh, I believe it was one of the uh, models. Uh, but it's it's somewhere in the ballpark of, um, I think we would be looking around 10,000 of our customers would. That, that many? Yeah, but of those the, we don't know how many also then have a water bill. Right, and that that's the rub is that PG&E there's a lot of apartment dwellers that pay their own gas bill where they would end up on a multi-unit uh, meter. So we only have one meter for that property, so they do not pay a water bill. If that's going to be our practice, I strongly encourage us on our card. We're going to be mailing it out to tell people in this card we're seeking those individuals who pay or have a water bill and are also on the PG&E lifeline rate, and then you might qualify and please give us the information. Otherwise, I see this as causing a great deal of confusion um, because we've already excluded them and we're not telling them they've been excluded. Right, so this will only go to ACWD customers, uh, and then what we can do, we can work on the card to make that more evident that that the board would like them. We won't say the board, but we'll make sure that um, we make it more clear in the card that they're participating PG&E CARES customer. They meet okay. that criteria, then right. they would be eligible for it. Otherwise, right. this would be very confusing. Right, okay. So if you could insert the footnote somewhere in there when you talk about income requirements, mm -hmm. just put in the reference that if you Qualify for the PG&E care program, you'll be qualified. We'll be receiving, not qualified, but they will receive, be receiving the PG&E lifeline rate. Then we would also consider giving them a water rate. Okay, so we'll, we'll clear yeah, you, we could talk about semantics, but I think you kind of get what we're looking yeah, for. Definitely. Any other questions, Director <coughs> Um Barry, I have a um, um, a recommendation to make if uh, you can afford us here. Um, I believe that each one of the three cities that we serve has a senior citizens commission. I've presented on this very topic to the Fremont senior citizens uh, uh, commission. And I think that it would be uh, good on our part to, um, if we don't give a formal presentation at one of their regular monthly meetings, that at least we send them a presentation update on um, our planned rollout of a uh, low income assistance program because I know that that is a, a big concern of sure. all the senior citizen groups around the community. Sure. Um, I think that would um, just be a, a really good thing for us to do. Good. Yeah, we can do that. Any other information for us? We seem to have interrupted you. 
No, this is great, actually. Okay. I, I, I like this. Um, so that that's the, the meat side of the card. And then uh, we just wanted to show the other side of the card, which is right there. Uh, and you'll see right under our logo, it has Customer Assistance Program Survey. So we just wanted to call that out. Excuse me, Wait. Mr. Carlson. Yes. Um, I think I heard some concerns from the directors that uh, they would not like personal information on a card. This looks like it's a postcard with a prepaid postage, yeah. so uh, we'll need to we'll need to look at that again. We'll do. <coughs> so under board of directors consideration, uh, what we will be doing after we uh, do the data collection, uh, we'll can during that time we'll also be developing the program as well, like we're doing tonight. Uh, then AC or staff will come back and present to the board the estimated participation levels based on those survey uh, results, also the funding levels. We're looking somewhere in the ballpark of around six months from now, expect us to come back to the board uh, for consideration. Hopefully the board adopts at that time. Uh, pending board adoption, now we get into the program timing. Uh, what we'll be doing is then designing and printing out the actual uh, enrollment cards for the customers. And remember that first one was just the survey just to kind of get a feel for what's out there. Now we're going to uh, hit up the customers again, uh, including those ones that said yes, definitely I'm you know, either part of PG&E Cares or you know, I, I want to look into it. I feel like I'm low income. Uh, we'll be contacting those folks with uh, postcards somewhere in spring of 2017 next year. And then lastly, that's when we start enrolling them. We start actually enrolling the qualified customers uh, into the program upon receipt. We just wanted to show the board uh, where we're at right now with the website. Uh, we actually have a page up, thanks to Shireen and her gang. Uh, we have the customer assistance program. again. This uh, talks about, shows the table in there for the, the funding levels and uh, qualifications. And then it also talks about that it's actually still under development mm -hmm. to let customers know that, that more information is coming. Uh, what we plan on doing is uh, having on there where a customer can enroll online if they would like to. Uh, Director Lee? check to see if these numbers are in sync with the pg e program? Yes. Yes, we have. So there you are. So yes. this is the PG&E. Yeah. All right. So now we get to the fun part, uh, the program naming. So what, what we did, we went out to the entire district, to all staff, took a survey. And we received uh, 18 uh, names. We took those names. We had those reviewed by our public relations folks. And uh, public relations folks came back with five. And so these uh, five names here are in no, or they're in alphabetical order. No, they're not prioritized by what staff recommends. But let me just read those off real quick. The five are ACWD Cares, H2O, meaning help to others, Help on Tap, Hope, helping out, payment efforts, and then lastly, WAVE, Water Assistance Value Enhancement. So what we wanted to do is watch the board in action on coming up with uh, the preferred name for this program. So I will let Madam so President lead the charge Before we go on there, this. I would like to see if any of our customers have comments. So do you want to vote on the name? Yes? Please, come forward. Please approach the podium. Thank you. Please, Mrs. Bush. Bush. <laughs> come on. Okay. Tony Bush, uh, Fremont. I like help on tap. You know why? Because I know right away what it's about. Boom. <laughs> mm. All right. Mr. Bush, Mr. Lamos? Nope. Okay. With that, then, the board. Okay, I'll fest up. I'll jump in. I, I like help on tap, too. <coughs> I, I like help on tap as well because my marketing background tells me that you have to be really focused on what the benefit of the program is, and I think that c communicates it very well. Um, we might, uh, since we, and, and this is uh, Water Awareness Month, and usually in the past we've had our calendar program here from, from the schools, but uh, 
we might want to open it up online to uh, uh, students for a suggested slogan because we have the time here, the benefit of time. But I like Help on Tap. <coughs> for one, I'd like Help on Tap myself, and I appreciate your input. Um, it's simple. It has a great message, and uh, it it goes in uh, line with the KISS assumption. Keep it simple, and um, it gets the message across. Thank you. Director Gunther? Well, it could be different, but I'll go along with help on that. <laughs> <laughs> Director Weed? The word tap brings another beverage to mind. Do you have a vote? Is that your vote? Then I'll, I'll, I'll go along with it. Yeah, I, I, I have to say coming from a regulatory... It's always a good substitute. <laughs> totally. Coming from a regulatory <laughs> background, acronyms just really kills me. So, <laughs> Help on Tap is nice and clear and no acronyms. Help on Tap by Connie Bush. All right. <laughs> I think we should give the board a round of applause and the public as well. I'm going to give a round of applause. That's really good. I thought this was going to be difficult. <laughs> that, that was nice. And with that, uh, any other questions or comments for me? Who's the winning employee who came up with that slogan? You know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we don't know. So special bonus and do yes. It was not me. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. With that, let's move on to the next item next staff presentation please thank you madam president um, we're quickly sort of reaching a point where the district will need to make decisions on uh, future water supplies both in terms of reliability and or quantity and uh, it looks like um, mr. Neiser will be making a presentation to the board this evening um, specifically on the California water fix update, uh, which is potentially a significant um, financial investment in water supply reliability for our customers. So uh, with that, I'll ask Mr. In, our manager of water resources, if he has any additional comments. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. <clears throat> I thought it might benefit the board to just kind of go over the little journey we've been taking you on the California water fix. It's been a number of months in a row. And back in February, we introduced the plan to evaluate California water fix. In March, we went over the, the big schedule. And then in April, just last month, we went over the proposed alternatives for analysis. Uh, this month, we're going to be looking at the needs assessment. And it'll be actually a tag team presentation by Thomas Neiser, who's our water resources planning manager, and then Sarah Mata, who's our water operations analyst, who's actually supporting two divisions within our department, the water supply division and the water resources planning group. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Thomas. Thank you, Stephen. I guess these are more important tonight. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. You stole a little bit of my thunder, but I appreciate you introducing Sarah ahead of me. Um, the uh, board is aware we've been bringing every month small updates on uh, water fix valuation or what we previously referred to as a business case. Reminding the board some background that come September time frame, we're going to be expected to make a decision on water fix. And uh, as the general manager just alluded to, uh, there's a couple of timely things that we're going to have to comment on, so we're kind of trying to dovetail that with this monthly update. Uh, what you have handed out, I'd really appreciate it if you don't look too far into those now because it's going to get really confusing really quick. and It'll make a lot more sense if you follow <coughs> along with us. What we handed out tonight is a, a presentation on some of the material we're bringing out. Over the next few months, we'll be bringing basically a similar presentation uh, so we can bring a lot of complex information each month, a small increment to add to your personal library. So when we get to September, we don't just drop it all like a ton of bricks. We've had some time to digest it and hopefully have some feedback for us along the way. Um, so to recall, we're working on a business case for the water fix program. We had two main questions. What's it worth and what do we really need? And tonight we're going to focus on that first question of what do we really need? Okay, so we've got to start with what's, what does it give us? 
what could we get for something else, but we need to know what we're looking for. So the needs assessment is the first step, okay? The uh, primary assumptions that are going to go into this needs assumption are based on, uh, well, this is where it gets complex. Last month you heard an update on the urban water management plan, which has been released. The public draft is up on the, on the internet right now. It's a working draft, administrative draft. Problem is, is that if you recall in the urban water management plan, we've been given three potential future baseline scenarios. The state has given us three visions of what the future might look like. Really makes this complex. Those three scenarios that I'll hit in a moment um, are high, medium, and low, basically. Uh, but before that, I just want to establish that all of the assessments that we'll be doing, we're looking out at the future, this, this elusive future build-out condition. We call it 2040 because that's the timeline in our urban water management plan. But it's when the current city plans have all been built and uh, we don't expect any more real growth and we expect the declines in our water supplies that we're anticipating to have a nice confluence, right? Maximum demand, minimum supply reliability. One thing that's not included in here is this governor's executive order that came out this week, which is looking to strengthen the uh, SB7 or 20 by 2020. So we expect demands to actually be a little bit further down. So we've got two things, somewhat conservative high demands for 2040, plus we're not accounting for this further regulatory intervention to bring demands down for future scenarios. So looking at the three baseline scenarios that we'll be evaluating uh, that were presented last month are, and we're using some easier to understand names. So we've got, there's uh, urban water management plan we're calling. That's, that's the baseline that we're putting in the urban water management plan that was presented here last month. Uh, we also have a worst case and then what we call water fix. Now, of course, Department of Water Resources uses these clever names, ELT, ECHO, ALT-4, because they make all kinds of sense to us, right? But we're calling them Urban Water Management Plan, Worst Case, Water Fix. And if you look at this little comparison, you'll see that all of them include climate change. Uh, the, the worst case, the ECHO, includes a tremendous amount of future environmental outflows, so the worst case assumes that down the road, the Delta is going to have more species of concern, there's going to be less water available for drinking water, more need to be prioritized for environmental conditions. And under water fix, uh, it includes some increased environmental outflows in the delta, but notably it has the isolated facility included. Okay. So with those three scenarios as our background for baseline, I would like to introduce Sarah Matta to come up to us. Uh, I just want to build a little bit on what Stephen said. Sarah's been working pretty much for the past year with the planning group, uh, doing a lot of the analytic work uh, that you've seen presented already in the urban water management plan. And as I was sitting here, I'm realizing this has actually been somewhat facilitated by the reorganization, by having water supply and planning now under the same department. So it's actually been a working example of uh, some efficiencies there. And with that. I think I'm actually going to stand here so I can do more of the pointing and less of the turning around over my shoulder. So thank you for the introduction, Thomas, Madam President, members of the board, members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity to present these results to you. Um, I've been working with Thomas over the past several months to analyze these three different scenarios and I'm excited to come here and present some preliminary results for you guys tonight. So with that, let's first look at these three data sets that we've been talking about that DWR provided to us for these analyses. Okay. This is a chart of our table A allocations projected to be available under the medium case scenario, which is the one we used for the urban water management plan. I think you've probably seen graphs like this before. They can be a little complicated to take in all at one glance, so what you should, a simple way to look at it is to think the higher the line, the more water will be available to ATWD in this projected future scenario. So this blue line is our uh, urban water management plan scenario that we used in the most recent analysis. The red line is the worst case scenario. You can see it's lower. That means there's less water projected to be available in these various years in the future. And the green line is what water would be available if we did invest in the water fix project. Slightly higher than the blue line. Um, a couple things to point out right away. The all three scenarios in the lower allocation ends, oh, where's my laser? In the lower allocation ends of about a zero to 30% table A allocation, they're pretty similar. We know that the water fix is not a dry year supply project. It's a normal and wet year supply project. If there's no snow in the Sierras, there's no water whether or not you build tunnels. 
In the medium and wet years, though, that's where we start to see differences in these two scenarios. And for ACWD, these differences could mean a lot of different things depending on how they play out year after year. And that's where our analysis has to come in and do some more complicated uh, calculations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we take this information and analyze what it means for ACWD over the long term in this future scenario. Um, first, a couple of, I guess, specifics to think about as we go forward. This red line is a rep represents approximately what ACWD would need from our state water project supplies in a typical year to run our treatment plants and provide supplemental groundwater recharge in a, a normal year type. We can see in the urban water management plan assumptions, this allocation would be projected to be available about 60% of the years in the future. In the worst case scenario, only 20% of years. And in the water fix project alternative, 67% of the years. This doesn't mean that we're going to see shortages in the 30% of remaining years because we have such a diverse water supply portfolio. And in order to really understand what it's going to mean, we have to bring all of our supplies together and run the model with everything. So I think you guys have heard about this model before. It's called the Integrated Resources Planning Model. It's an 80-year model with monthly and daily time steps, and it's ACWD specific. And for this analysis, we're using the future build-out demand case, um, so relatively high demand. And we take some input data, the DWR availability, San Francisco availability, our ACWD production facilities and operations, including how we use semi-tropic storage. And we also take a historic precipitation record that is an 80-year record. It represents historic droughts, historic wet periods. So we put all this together, and we did three separate runs, one for each of the three scenarios DWR provided us. We get some outputs. There's a lot of information that we can take away. Um, we're interested in how frequently shortages occur and how large they are, how healthy our local groundwater conditions are, how we can use semi-tropic storage, and actually lots of other things. Um, I think in past presentations, Thomas has proposed these evaluation criteria, cost, risk, reliability. You'll start to see these played out um, over the next couple slides as I go through results. And um, they're also going to be summarized on that matrix, the 11 by 17. Uh, so hopefully the slides in the matrix will start to piece together as we go ahead. <coughs> So first set of criteria that we evaluated. Now these are taking the results from our 80-year planning model, comparing the three different scenarios. So the first set of things we looked at was reliability. What was the worst single year supply shortfall? For our urban water management plan, it was about 15%. And I believe you saw these results um, in the urban water management plan presentations recently. For the worst multiple dry year period, the single worst shortfall for a single year in that dry period was 8% uh, with an average of about 3% shortfalls year over year. And the frequency of shortages is about 1 in 20 years. Um, just a quick aside that one of our ACWD planning criteria is no more than 10% shortfall once every 30 years. Uh, but I want to keep in mind here that we're projecting out into the future with conservatively high demands and actually we're fairly close to meeting this planning criteria. So keep that in mind as we're going forward to look at the other scenarios. We have our worst case scenario. No project, but increased environmental outflows required in the Delta. Our single dry year shortfall increases to 34%, which is a significant difference from the urban water management plan scenario. Our worst multiple dry year period the single worst year in that period is 34% shortfall, with an average year over year of a 15% shortfall. And the frequency of shortages increases as well, to about three every 20 years. And if we look at the water fix projects, we see, unsurprisingly, it's similar to the urban water management plan assumptions. Again, we know that water fix is not a dry year supply. And 
don't worry too much about the 1% difference in our single dry year shortfall. Um, when we're looking at the amount of uncertainty that we're looking at and projecting out into the future this far, uh, I think a 1% difference in results should really be considered comparable. So we should consider the reliability of the urban water management plan assumptions and the water fix alternative to be similar. Uh, the next set of evaluation criteria I want to talk about are cost. And before I do so, I just want to point out that these shortages in the worst case scenario are very high and we haven't represented them financially in our cost evaluation. So just keep that in mind. And I'll look at the cost table. Here we have our first scenario, urban water management plan. We're assuming no new capital projects related to the water fix investment, um, hence the zero new capital costs. And from our 80-year planning model, we can calculate the average cost for water supply and production uh, over the 80-year period. And that annual cost for the urban water management plan is 34.7, uh, approximately $35 million a year. And that includes the chemicals and power to run the treatment plants, the fixed and variable state water project costs, the cost to exercise our semi-tropic storage, and of course, our San Francisco purchase costs. Is there a dollar per acre foot estimate that goes along with this? Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but our build-out demands are 48 and some MGD. So we could do a quick calculation. So it's about three quarters of that. Okay. Thomas, I would ask you to come up to the mic since this oh, meeting okay. is being recorded. But, no, if you're looking at 48, it's coming in yeah. on $750 an acre foot. So I'm just trying to get a, that we're not, we're keeping our, our give a ballpark estimate of what our cost would be. Right. Just for the record, though, this is not a dollar per acre foot type unit analysis. This is including power, chemical cost, a lot of operating, everything except labor. This is all the marginal costs that go into running our choice of plants and, and the water supplies that we're using. So it's not quite that kind of analysis, but I think you'll see how this data is used for the okay. comparison in a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, all right. In our worst case scenario, again, we're assuming that we're not investing in the Cal Water Fix, so no capital cost there. And the long-term average water supply and production cost is slightly increased, slightly more than $35 million a year. Uh, this increase is due to increased San Francisco purchases that we make in order to make up for the shortfall in our state water project supplies. Uh, but I want to emphasize, and I apologize, I probably should have had a note on the slide to emphasize this, that this does not include the cost to ACWD and the community that we serve that would be incurred if we saw 34% shortfalls in supply. So those costs are not being included in the monetary cost. This is simply, what do we pay for chemicals to run the treatment plant? How much is our San Francisco bill? So keep that in mind, comparing these numbers. <coughs> and the water fix, we are assuming a uh, little more than $100 million to invest in water fix. And then we're also including uh, about $25 million to upgrade TP1 which we would want to do in this higher demand scenario, especially if we have increased state water project supplies available, which means we could be running TP1 more often during high demand periods. So if we amortize that to an annual cost, it's about $7.5 million. Meanwhile, the average cost for the water supply and production drops to $30 million. This is due to a decrease in our average San Francisco cost because we don't have to buy as much San Francisco, we can meet our customer demands using surface water treatment from state water project supplies. So when we compare the total of these three costs, we see that they're pretty similar. And actually, given the amount of uncertainty in this analysis, uh, except for the supply shortfall, actually these costs are pretty similar. All right. There, oh yes, and just want to emphasize the reason that this operating cost is lower due to decreased San Francisco purchases. All right, 
a couple other factors. Some of these factors are a little complicated, so instead of trying to quantify them with numbers, I'm going to use this legend of oh, wrong one. neutral, open circle, plus sign, positive impact, ne minus sign, negative impact. So we have the urban water management plan assumptions. Since this is our urban water management plan, uh, I suggest that we consider the water quality, local control, and resiliency inherent in that scenario to be our neutral point from which we compare the other two scenarios. That's why these are considered neutral. Uh, some other factors, the amount of unused state water project supplies in this scenario is about 3,000 acre feet a year. Now keep in mind, this doesn't happen evenly year after year. It happens when there's a period of very wet conditions that coincide with wet local conditions which means our Lake Del Val supplies are very full. Our local groundwater is very healthy. And we don't have enough in-service area demand to take all the water, and the semi-tropic bank doesn't have enough capacity to take all our water when we need to send it. So we have to leave behind some of our state water project supplies. When you average out those occurrences over the 80-year planning period, it's about 3,000 acre feet per year. And our unused San Francisco purchases about 1,800 acre feet a year on average. Some years we buy all of our San Francisco purchases, some years we buy less. Um, and that just depends on the availability of other supplies in the planning model. If we compare the worst case scenario, there's an increase in water quality. Um, there's two factors going on here. The first is that when we have less state water project water available, we buy more San Francisco water, which is higher quality. So there's an improvement to water quality in our distribution system. The second factor is that with the increased environmental flows required in the delta, actually the delta freshens up. And though there is less water being delivered to us on the SBA, it is fresher. So that's a benefit to water quality. Local control is negatively impacted in this scenario during locally dry conditions. Uh, this one's also a little nuanced. If we think of local control as having supplies locally that are healthy when we need them, in this worst case scenario, we have to draw more heavily on our groundwater during dry periods because there's less state water project available. And when the dry period lasts for more than one or two years, we find that our local supply of groundwater is very unhealthy. It's negatively impacted by the lack of state water project that was several years prior. Uh, and resiliency is similar. If there was an earthquake or flood or disaster in the delta, we would be just as impacted in this worst case scenario as we would be in the urban water management plan scenario. Uh, the two unused imported supply factors, there's less unused state water project supply, but this is because there are less high allocation years from the state water project. And there's less unused San Francisco supply because we have to buy more of it on average to meet our customer demand. And finally, if we were to take the water fix scenario, we find a benefit in water quality because we're diverting in the North Delta where water quality is improved. The local control stays similar to the urban water management plan scenario. We're able to keep our local groundwater healthy uh, in these leading up <coughs> to these dry periods. And our resiliency is improved because the tunnels are considered not as vulnerable to disasters such as earthquakes or floods in the Delta. There is a lot more unused state water project uh, because there are more high allocation years. And there is a lot more San Francisco because we don't need to buy as much San Francisco year over year in order to meet our customer demands. We're able to use the increased availability of the water fix allocations in normal to wet years to decrease our San Francisco purchases. So just a couple more outputs from the planning model. Uh, I know it's a lot of information. This is a graph of BHF groundwater levels in the three scenarios. It's an 80-year time, and as you know, our groundwater fluctuates seasonally, and that's why it's doing so many up and down, up and down. But what I want to draw your attention to is that in the worst case scenario, the red line, which is no project but increased environmental flow requirements, our local groundwater is negatively impacted in these 
moderate to dry periods. However, the rest of the years, all three scenarios behave similarly. And then the next one we want to look at is our semi-tropic storage. So here the y-axis is storage in semi-tropic in acre feet. And over the 80-year period, you can see in the urban water management plan scenario how we exercise semi-tropic storage. During dry periods, we draw it down. During wet periods, we fill it back up. Um, and in the worst case scenario, the first drought we hit, we deplete our semi-tropic storage and we're never quite able to fill it up again. So this should tell us that in a worst case scenario like this, we have some time while we're depleting our semi-tropic storage where we won't have huge reliability issues, but after that we won't be able to exercise our semi-tropic storage. And the water fix scenario looks much more healthy. We're drawing it down during the dry periods and filling it back up in the wet periods. And in fact, what the water fix scenario does that the other two scenarios don't do is it has some exercising in this top 50,000 acre feet of semi-tropic storage. This allows us to bring back semi-tropic in order to avoid purchasing San Francisco supplies. So this exercising in the green area allows us to optimize our water supply portfolio to decrease cost. So that was a lot of information. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Do we yeah. have any questions yeah. from the audience? No. Um, directors? <coughs> Director Sethi? Thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, all of my thoughts I'm going to express here are very pre preliminary. It's just the nature of the beast that we're dealing with and trying to come to a, uh, a wise judgment of what to do. But um, some preliminary thoughts are, one, I um, back the governor's California water fix proposals. Um, and for the benefit of the public here, I, I support the twin tunnels. If we're not selfish, I believe that if we think about all of California's needs, um, this is something a good investment for the next couple of hundred years. I believe that there is a balance that we can achieve with the twin tunnels where the environment comes first for the delta and protection of the delta, and then urb, urban and agricultural interests. Um, just because we build the tunnels doesn't mean that that the uh, all the water uh, goes through the tunnels for, for urban and ag. Um, we can certainly set, set aside the proper amount for the Delta first. Um, that aside, we as a district, uh, which benefits from, from uh, Delta supplies, 40% approximately of our water needs, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure whether this is a good sound investment for our community right now. 130, maybe even up to 150 million dollars of cost is uh, quite, an, quite a burden for us to think about taking on. I believe that we need to look at all of the other options first, like um, the Los Vaqueros partnership, uh, raising the dam and <clears throat> adding supplies there and building a pipeline. Um, down to Tracy uh, to the uh, connection with the state water project. Uh, the sites reservoir, of course, um, would provide us with extra supply and I really like the uh, concept paper that we submitted for expansion of water supplies at Lake Del Val. 50,000 acre feet would certainly uh, benefit this community for a long time to come, uh, even, in, even if we're sharing that with other uh, agencies. And uh, then lastly, uh, we need to consider uh, what our options are for a recycled water facility in, uh, jointly with um, Union Sanitary District. So those are just some preliminary thoughts and um, I look forward to more detailed information between now and September. <laughs> 
Thank you. Director Kohler? Yes, sir. Um, your uh, integrated resources planning model, I, IRPM overview, using an 80 year model, um, it kind of uh, gets me because I've, I've, uh, it's my understanding that the last 100 years has been wet in, in this nation, literally. And uh, we've, we've gone through a, a, a complete cycle of unusual moisture throughout to the Sierras and the Rockies and all the way through. Um, I'm a little concerned about having the assumption that we're going to see that same, uh, all the data will be able to mirror the last 80 years. I, I don't see it happening. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, I just watched a science special on uh, the condition of the Midwest from Texas all the way up to Nebraska that uh, we're just a years away from having another uh, dust bowl in, in the central part of the United States. There's a projection that California will have to double their ag production by the year 2050. And I see that to be a, a challenge for all of us, urban and ag, to be able to come up with a a reliable water supply if that's the case where we have to double our, our agricultural production. That's based on the need for food worldwide. That's not just our weather situation. And going to uh, page five on this, this packet you gave me, when you have results and the cost and you redline the $30 million, is that the did you include $10 million a year that ACWD will contribute to the water fix? That I think is represented in the capital cost of the water fix. That's okay. All right. Um. So, so actually, we still have part two of this presentation. Okay. So oh, I'm sorry for not being more clear. Uh, no. Oh. So okay. if if the board would indulge us, we could finish the presentation. Okay. Thank you. I thought we were done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's an overwhelming amount of information. I'll finish up from here. Um, the actually a great kickoff to the discussion and great questions, and they're actually getting addressed right up here. So uh, if we'll just get through the <coughs> next couple slides, and, and we can continue right where we are at this moment. So. Um, there's two objectives here tonight. One, one is to do our perennial update that we're bringing to the board month over month on water fix. Uh, the second is to discuss the what we truly need part because there's some near-term decision making that, that this board's going to have to make uh, and it's going to come before September and so that's what we're trying to get you ready for. Um, so what I want to do is do a preliminary conclusions of the water fix data that we have, just looking at the three baseline scenarios we have, not including the alternative projects, which we're still bringing, uh, that are part of this longer term process of valuing the water fix and alternatives, but just what is the baseline that the Department of Water Resources has said may be your future, ACWD, this might be your future, because we have to decide which one of these futures we, we think is reality, and, and maybe hedge a bet, maybe, maybe gamble a little bit, not sure. Um, so, but what can we say by using these three data sets that we've been provided with? Um, well, we can say here that if demands go up as we project and remind you that this, this we're in a drought, we expect rebound, and even if the rebound doesn't happen, the three cities in combination are looking to add 30,000 housing units over the next few decades. We will see demands go up. So how much they go up, we're not sure. But if they go up anywhere near what we think they will, mind you, still lower than they were just five years ago at our build out, we're projecting lower demand than we saw just a few years back. If that happens, if we have the tunnels in place, if we invest in the tunnels, the results of these studies indicate that we will be able to maintain our existing level of reliability, critical dry year, multiple dry year, that the tunnels appear to work very well with our existing supplies and investments, namely semi-tropic, we can keep semi-tropic topped off, we can use it to supplement uh, purchases, uh, reduce our purchases of San Francisco to optimize cost, uh, it will help us protect us against sea level rise. Uh, one thing we got to remember is that they're talking 15 centimeters of sea level rise in the next 20 years. There's new projections coming out that saying it might be going faster and higher. 
uh, if we have more water, as Sarah showed, uh, in the tunnels options, we more frequently have our groundwater basin healthy above sea level. The tunnels finally, and I think this is really the, the interesting part that came out of this, when you combine our sort of optimized operating costs with the annual capitalization costs to fund the tunnels plus maybe including a TP1 enhancement, it's not quite the big investment risk that we were all, you know, we're choking on that pill when we first heard the numbers. Because we're able to save so much on San Francisco purchases every year, or on average, uh, that we can almost offset the capitalization costs from the assumptions that we're working with uh, by avoided, costs, uh, avoided purchases of San Francisco. So that's part of what we're trying to get at with this analysis, is when we put all our supplies together, what does it really look like? Um, but the, you know, the key thing we have to remember is that the tunnels will not improve our dry year reliability. That's a major thing we all have to remember. So we're talking about maintaining our existing level of service uh, and pr potentially having a better, more cost-optimized future. We've got more water in the bank, semi-tropic. We've got more water in the local groundwater basin. That's our bird in hand. And those are invaluable. When, you know, if the earthquake strikes, if you've got a full groundwater basin, that's great. If the, if the uh, allocation drops to 15 percent, more water in semi-tropics, what we want. So those are the conditions that we get with the tunnel. Uh, additional findings are that, uh, you know, should we have a worst case scenario, meaning <coughs> have the demands rebound, but the environmental requirements in the delta go up, but no tunnels are built. Maybe the tunnels get blocked by environmental concerns, interests. Uh, but at the same time, we have to do new species of concerns. If our long-term reliability drops to 40, 45 percent, what does that mean? Looks pretty grim. Uh, if our demands continue to grow as forecast, we have much higher operating costs every year. We've got very high sh reliability uh, shortfalls uh, and more frequent as well. Uh, we just looked at this number. Between 20 and 35 percent shortfalls become one, one in 20 years versus 10 percent once in 30 years. Uh, th we would have to need, we would need to invest in a new alternative water supply for sure, and we'll be bringing those analyses in the next couple months. Um, but the good news is we do have time to decide. Our demands are very low. If we were to move to an echo situation, this worst case, if the delta reliability dropped off tomorrow, we have a lot of water in the bank down in semi-tropic. We have a good contract with San Francisco, and we've got a lot of time to actually implement a new water supply, and that's a very positive thing that uh, I, I really want to highlight. That's, that's something a lot of agencies don't have. If the, if the music stops, I mean, you've got to find a place to sit. We've got 100,000 acre feet sitting in semi-tropic right now, and that would carry us through at least a decade to supplement lower allocations while we develop a new supply. Uh, if demands remain low, this is still to be determined. So if we have a worst case scenario but demand stays suppressed, if we don't see a drought response, if people have made permanent changes, if, if growth is really, really slow. Uh, that's an analysis that we're still going to be uh, performing over the next couple months to find out just how much time we have to make a decision. So this is actually, a, if, if you consider the position of risk, we have the luxury of time. We have the luxury of time. Um, and uh, we only, oh, what did I say here? Only need to make an investment, excuse me, and reliability concepts given the worst case. So an investment in reliability, I'm talking about IPR, desal, alternative water supplies, the things we've been talking about. We only need to do those right now, critically need to do them, under a worst case. So given that, and we're bringing these cases to you this, this couple months, but in the coming fiscal year, there's going to be some uh, pay-to-play type decisions that the board's going to have to make, and they're going to be coming up uh, and the board workshops at 26, May 26, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring you an update on some of these expenses. These are the things we've been talking about these past few months. These are expenses coming that are not in our budget currently. We've got the Cal water fix. As we know, come September, we need to decide whether or not we're in or out. That's a fair amount of money. Uh, Los Vicaros. Los Vicaros is preparing their uh, environmental and feasibility studies. Uh, they're looking for the partners to contribute money this coming fiscal year. So we'll have to take a look at that. Uh, also, the Sites Reservoir, as was noted, uh, Sites Reservoir is taking res <coughs> reservoir reserve shares uh, as we speak. They're looking at even by July to expect people to commit money per acre foot of storage and participation. So that's also potentially a lot of money. We'll have these numbers for the board at the on the 26th. Altogether, this is probably a million dollars, uh, and so we're going to have to, you know, if we want to keep keep uh, all of these options alive, 
that's a lot of money we have to contribute in the next in the coming fiscal year. Um, none of these are in our current budget. So the next steps, uh, we've got the May workshop. We'll bring those dollars. The point here is in, if we don't want to think of a worst case scenario, if we want to look at maybe the environmental conditions in the delta only get gradually worse or the tunnels get built, there's no reliability-based discussion right now, necessity to have an alternative water supply. Local control might be better, some of the other intangibles might be better, but as far as meeting our reliability goals, both the tunnels or our urban water management plan scenario meet our current reliability requirements. The worst case does not. So with that, the next, uh, it's working wonderfully. Over the next couple months, we'll be bringing these remaining scenarios that we've presented to the board already. Uh, that near term is basically worst case under low demand. That's how dire is the situation if it happens tomorrow. Indirect potable reuse, as the board's aware, we're studying that now. We've got a draft report with some costing. It's got more information available. We're ready to start doing the modeling on that. Bay desalination and the Los Vaqueros uh, studies as well. So with that, we can hand over to questions, either technical or procedural. Madam President, I have a f just a few more comments. Director I'll try to Sethi. keep them quick. Um, you know, in thinking about this further, we, we need to take into consideration some other public interests here for our community, I believe. I'm just expressing my own personal point of view here. That... Um, <coughs> You know, it's not so uh, bad to rely on Hetch Hetchy water. It's, you know, it's the purest water in the nation, supposedly, and uh, there are a lot of people that appreciate the quality of Hetch Hetchy water. Uh, and when we blend it with our groundwater, we come up with a, a good quality water for the community. Um, even at the very depth of the drought right now, we were not even approaching running out of uh, availability of Hetch Hetchy water, although San Francisco is asking us to conserve. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people in the community that are willing to pay a premium uh, in their water bill to get Hetch Hetchy water. So <clears throat> on the other side of, the, of looking at things, if we were to invest in the Twin Tunnels, um, you still have dirty water that you need to uh, put through a, a water treatment plant and process uh, before it's delivered to the community. That uh, means that we have to entertain possibly firing back up t uh, treatment plant number one up in Mission San Jose, which we just decommissioned <coughs> for, uh, you know, uh, some millions of dollars of annual savings. And... Um, And the, the one, I, I call it kind of a red herring. It's almost like we have to invest in the twin tunnels to protect our groundwater levels against sea level rise. But the, the fact is, unless I'm wrong, we still will be able to bring in delta water, even if we don't invest in the twin tunnels, to protect our underground water. The, the graphics which were shown reflect the availability of delta water for supplementing local recharge. So that is with having a reduced availability of delta water. So we are still importing water. Uh, the scenarios, the, the, the graphic shown is the difference between the amount we have to do that operation. Yeah, that's regardless of whether we invest in the twin tunnels or not. So the twin tunnels is the green line I just point out we like to be between 20 foot and 10 foot on the, the bottom end. Yeah. So when we're in that zone, that's where we like to be. That's where we are typically. This is pretty serious drought conditions. In fact, we model everything in our system to not go below basically that level. It's reflected as minus three feet. So that's, yeah. that basically means we bottomed out. If we don't have the supplemental tunnels, we are more reliant on local water. And when you go into the drought, you're already in an impaired position. So when you get into that drought, you're bottoming out the groundwater basin within the first year, a couple of years of a, an extended drought. Mm -hmm. The way I look at things is if we were to invest in, uh, be a partner in the, in the twin tunnels, <coughs> we are going to have to make a, 
a significant uh, investment. We're going to amortize that cost over um, all of our ratepayers uh, in the future. It's going to be a significant increase in their their water bill. And on the opposite side, if we were to um, be a little bit more reliant on Hetch Hetchy water, we're spreading that cost out over the future. The cost we know will be going up, um, but we have to um, weigh all these things out in the future, and it, it's kind of a tough decision, but uh, I don't want us to get lost in a discussion where we have to invest in the twin tunnels just to protect our Niles Cone aquifer. That's it. Thank you, Director Seppi. Director Kohler? Yes. Um, I have one scenario <coughs> that you didn't put up there, Tom and, and Sarah, was if the sea level rise does moderately go up, what would be our expected performance for our groundwater situation? Great question. So basically you can assume we, we don't like to go below sea level. Correct. Sea level zero on this chart. If we see a foot of sea level rise, we won't want to go below one foot. So it's pretty pretty linear. The, the That target is going to be from our sort of current baseline. So if you'll notice, you don't need to do a lot of math here. Correct. You can see all okay. these green lines are pretty healthy above five feet with some exceptions. And our existing policy is to go as low as minus five feet, but we want that to be the very end of a critically dry period. Okay. So if you look at those green lines, even the blue ones, our existing urban water management plan, we're, we're pretty much above zero almost all the time with the exception of our drought of record. However, if the sea level rise goes up 12 inches, it's mm -hmm. going to substantially change our graph. Yep. Two of those scenarios look great, one of them not so great. Thank you. Thank you, Director Kohler. Director Gunther. Well, first, I'd like <laughs> to say thanks a lot. It's very interesting, uh, <coughs> um, formative and stuff we're going to need to make some decisions. Um, I agree the Twin Tunnel Project will be a significant investment. Uh, but I have a couple questions regarding, we don't really talk much about Hetch Hetchy reliability. If I'm not mistaken, um, and maybe you could provide the year, wasn't there a year when Hetch Hetchy reliability was like almost going to go dry? And I believe they tapped into the State Water Project during that year. Uh, in the 87 to 92 drought, they actually put State Water Project water in the system. And, and they put it into uh, I think we need to identify that. I mean, we were lucky this year in that their impact was significantly less than where the state was, which in this year harmed us significantly more. But we rely upon in our calculations that we're going to have that available. And I think we may want to look at what if we don't have that available in our worst case scenarios? Because if they've tapped in, which historically they did in 87, if the state was as bad as it was this year and they were as bad as they were back then, what is that scenario? Because I think that one is one we want to watch. And it, I, I agree there's a lot of stuff still out there. and and it's hard to get our hands around it. I mean, there's a lot of good data here, but I think that's some of the scenario that we may want to look at because our scenarios here seem to rely on the fact we're going to be able to get that water. And if we can't get that water, what is that, and the impact of that? Um, obviously, there's ways we could address that by trying to get more reliability, local reliability, certainly local water supply, and there may be ways to do that. But um, at this point, I, I'm still a firm believer in reliability. I, I do believe that buys us a reliability, but I think we need to put in our calculations Hetch Hetchy failure. Uh, I think our own local groundwater basin, which we saw that when we took it down for a project, that I don't necessarily think it's going to happen again. Um, I don't know if we would need to do something like that. Uh, we've been there. I mean, we, um, we've kind of been there. We 
we know what's going to happen. Uh, we have some pretty good data. But what we didn't account for was what happens if HIG is bad as well. And I'll leave my comments there for now. I think uh, we got a long way to go on this. Um, but exactly right. I, I would like to address one thing, though, because the board heard this last month, but it's a lot of data. Uh, that data in there includes San Francisco's projected reliability, including that 87 to 92 period. Mm -hmm. It reflects their improvement. Uh, and if you'll recall, we took their improvements and we cut them in half. And we said, we're not confident that you guys are going to see all of this improved. So some of that's already calculated in. Our okay. assumptions about San Francisco reliability are the most conservative out of all of Bosca. Everybody okay. else has taken San Francisco at word. We took their improvements and we cut them in half. Hmm. Thank you. Good. Director Wee. Um, the tunnel project would result in about 10% rate increase for each of the next 30 years. So I can, um, I think that's what that presents. It provides no additional water. It does improve reliability and improves quality. Okay. With the tunnels, we can learn how we use our production cost. Because our experience has been we've been purchasing the minimum amount of San Francisco water each year. And the two years we did not, we one we shot ourselves in the foot by drawing down our groundwater basin to to work on the uh, lad fish ladders, et cetera. So we were vulnerable when we got hit with the drought, and we got caught short foot. Um, our alternate water supplies. What's um, I'm somewhat uh, dismayed that we're looking at 48 MGD for recycled water. When we did the alternate water, this is on our chart here, your last chart. Um, much less when we did that study of the water that supply requirements. That's system level of demand, just to be clear. These, this modeling is under future high demand, not present low demand. So that's under a future 48 MGD, our sort of build out level of demand. For recycled water? No, no, just our, our distribution system demand, total demand for potable water when it reaches 48 MGD. That's kind of our peak future build out level. Okay, so that's not related to asking for 48 MGD mm -hmm. of no, recycled no, 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 water. No, no, no. Recycled oh. water okay. would be 8,000 All right, that's, that's all. Yeah, between 40. Um, All right, yeah, this was from the old presentation. 43 is kind of where we were before the drought. But you're talking about system wide, not, and when I read that, I read it as 48 MGD of recycled right, yeah, water. Yeah, they, they, they basically <laughs> use the same number so you could compare the different alternatives. Well, that's the way to look at it. It's not what we <laughs> want to we, do. We could supply a good portion of the East Bay right, with that right, amount of water. <laughs> these are long term capital investments, so we have to be looking at the next <coughs> decade. Okay. Uh, the Val is not identified as one of your alternatives to look at, and I would encourage you and you uh, with the ability, to, because what comes with the Los Vaqueros is really the inner tie, and it's a subset. The Los Vaqueros with the dam raising and the inner tie. I would encourage them to do the inner tie because that is new water. And when tied with Del Val, it becomes a potential for a year round water supply. So just remind the board that from Contra Costa Water District's own modeling, the new water that's available by uh, participating in, in Los Vaqueros expansion with Transfer Bethany is about a thousand acre feet. There's actually not water, it's mostly conveyance and, and management. Their own modeling on their own water right that would be available for us to purchase from them at a cost yet to be determined is only about a thousand acre feet long term average. My suggestion is that with Del Val tied in, we can be looking at as much as 50,000 acre feet of storage, of which we can hopefully get a portion of it. And then during the winter months, the lines come, they have a tendency to slip. Litigation is coming. And so it's it's one of those things that it's, I, I don't see it as, a, as firm a uh, criteria as we might be. No, I do. Not. The only response I would have is we have no intention of waiting till September to not have results under the assumption that the right. times will Continue slip. So we'll still, we'll still prepare for September, and the board will be empowered to make a decision at that time. Right. And, and in the intervening period, what we're trying to do is further develop this tapestry of water supply alternatives um, so that the board has as much information as possible uh, to make decisions when we need to make decisions. There are some of the factors. Please. The ability to put the 10% uh, increase in rates on the property tax bill was uh, challenged in uh, a letter from John Scan and before Zone 7. Hopefully, we'll have a resolution on that. 
that if, they're, if they can find a way to buy, get Kern to buy in, I understand that would be over 70% model and the tunnels then meet their business plan criteria and we're along for the ride. Well, at that Thank time we can, make an, right. we can make that no, decision. No, the decision is coming up on site. And 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 we will have a very good discussion at the May board workshop when we have more numbers that we could have a better discussion. Okay. So I, I think that's a perfect segue to for a perfect topic to discuss for May. Thank you very much. Yeah, for thank the, you. Uh, heads up and we'll keep so the yeah, these are great ideas. I am looking forward to the other alternatives. It is no secret that I'm not convinced that the water fix is good for our customers. So I'm looking forward to the other alternatives. One thing I'll ask you to keep in mind is that we are assuming the water fix will deliver the reliability. Has anybody taken in consideration of potential changes in regulatory climate? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> the purpose of the three baselines that we're presenting is it's anybody's guess. Okay, got it. And that's going to have to weigh in the board. It's going to have to critically consider the what if of these three scenarios. Right. Presented. And to be perfectly clear, the results we're presenting are based on the assumptions that the board has been seeing for the past few months, the results of our simulations, our models. That's it. Okay. It's not an advocacy for one position or another, but, but the facts are that that should the water fix present right. itself the way they say it will, uh, that there are certain benefits. Right. Like one more yes, Director Weed, <laughs> please be quick. The water fix is still somewhat in motion. It hasn't been fully locked in. The negotiations with the Contra Costa are giving them 40,000 acre feet of water may modify the analysis that they only have 1,000 acre feet to deal with. Um, or DWR, because that's an extraordinary opportunity and I'd also suggest that we talk, look at the putting a direct connection from the South Bay Aqueduct to our quarry, to our pits, quarry lakes, via the secret sidewalk. Oh. And see if we can <laughs> thank that thank you, Director Week. These are <coughs> subjects that we could talk about at the next workshop. I think we have kicked this particular subject around quite a few times. So with that, anything thank else for us, Thomas? Time. Nope, that's it. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Great presentation, yeah. both of you. All right, with that, let's move on to general manager's report, please. Uh, yes, we have, uh, I believe, just the two items that are on the agenda for the board this evening. I'm looking at staff. I don't see any other general manager reports. So um, the first item involves the potential support of the district for a California budget package to address water accessibility and affordability. Uh, this is one of those issues where things are moving fast. And Mr. Wren will provide an update on that item. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, and he's passing out the actual draft letter that's being proposed at this time. <clears throat> So the draft uh, letter that's before you now is a, a potential support letter for the California budget package to address water accessibility and affordability. Uh, the California Urban Water Agencies or CUA member agencies have been invited to individually sign, a let sign this letter of support for a $56 million California budget package to address water accessibility and affordability. The letter of support is addressed to Governor Brown and legislative leaders, and the main message is that access to safe, affordable drinking water should be a priority in the 2016-2017 state spending plan. In addition, some of the main messages that you'll find in this letter are that urban water agencies are committed to providing safe, clean, and affordable water for all customers, including low-income households, although this is increasingly difficult due to a variety of forces, including the drought. Uh, the agencies are supportive of ongoing efforts by governmental and non-governmental organizations to make safe, high-quality water accessible to residents in both urban and more rural disadvantaged communities across California. 
And the agencies are concerned that other funding alternatives, such as public goods charge, would incre increase the cost of water service for all users, including economically disadvantaged customers. And the agencies are supportive of the $56 million budget augmentation from the general fund and the greenhouse gas reduction fund to address these critical issues. And I think that's really the core of where ACWD's interest is, is not to impact our low income customers. And finally, the agencies are encouraging further definition and quantification of the problem so that realistic and targeted solutions can be developed and implemented to improve water supply for rural disadvantaged communities over the long term. Our legislative advocate, Ron Davis, and staff have reviewed the letter of support and are recommending that the district sign this letter of support, which needs to be submitted tomorrow. And I'll turn this back over to our general manager. Just a couple of additional points. Um, as the board is well aware, there are areas in our state where folks don't, do not have access to water, period. Wells are running dry, as well as areas in the state where, although there is available water, there aren't the either financial or technical means to treat it. So people actually have water in their communities that is not safe to drink. Um, the urban water agencies of the state um, recognize that this is a big deal, but we are concerned that the state would adopt a public goods charge, uh, which would be applied to urban water users to help address the problem. Uh, this looks like an opportunity in which the state would be using its general fund money to address the issue. And interestingly, and I think what makes the most sense in terms of uh, ACWD's interests is that this would be the first time that greenhouse gas reduction funds could be allocated to addressing this issue as well. There is a nexus because of the uh, conservation aspects as well. So um, a number of agencies have agreed to sign on to this. Um, I was planning on doing it uh, this evening actually and, and getting the letter in, into, uh, into Ron um, unless I hear objections. Thoughts on thoughts and comments from directors? <clears throat> Just a couple of quick ones. Is this letter addressed from ACWD to these different parties here? Essen essentially, there'll be it'll be a letter that is signed by the general managers of multiple agencies. Um, Might I ask that we also include on the CC list um, water education for Latino leaders? Well, um, Director Weed and I have attended a couple of conferences. And uh, at one of which we heard uh, uh, the Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon, speak. And uh, I was able to speak with him for a few minutes afterward. Uh, Director Weed and I were also at a conference in Sacramento where um, the Senate Minority Leader, Gene Fuller, gave a very nice presentation on this very subject. And I believe both are earnestly trying to push uh, for this right now. Thank you. Director Kohler? Well, just a couple comments. Um, number one, uh, I, I think it's a, a opportune time to suggest a different source of revenue for this obligation, and I call it an obligation, to deal with this uh, shortage of fresh water in many areas of California. Um, but knowing what's happening with uh, not only Flint, Michigan, but many areas of the United States where uh, unacceptable water quality is being noted uh, in the media and the, and the EPA is getting involved now. Um, I, I think this is a, a good way for California to deal with uh, our issues in, in the um, unfortunate communities that don't have uh, acceptable water um, and I think we'd be ahead of the game by supporting this uh, effort with this particular letter so that that's my comment thank you director Gunther unfortunately I, I, I support the letter unfortunately I, I I'm concerned where the money will be spent um, and I see this as 
a necessary evil that we're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. However, we, I consider us as a re very responsible district. And we've suffered recently because of that responsibility. Where we've had to raise rates and we've had to deal with our problems. And we're down here discussing the Twin Tunnel, possible increasing of there. My concern is we're going to spend $56 million and it's going to flow out and there'll be no results. Flint, Michigan didn't happen overnight. Washington, D.C. didn't happen overnight. Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, had a very similar problem. My brother lives in the district. He couldn't drink his water. These problems are local responsibilities. The situation after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans was a local responsibility and it was taken over by the federal government. That never should have happened. We ended up paying for that. I said I'll support it. I believe it's a novel way to do it. I, I don't. If we don't support it, we're going to see a commodity charge. We're going to get that. But I just hope somewhere people will say, okay, here's money, but you're going to be held responsible with what you do this with. Because I don't see that happening. I just don't. And it's local. It's closer than we think to our own service area. That's what I've got to say. Thank you. I support it. Sign Thank it, please. you, Director Gunther. Director Weed. I uh, strongly support it uh, on the area of people to be copied or at least informed. The California Water Commission, the last two commissioners, came out of the Environmental Justice Committee, uh, communities, Environmental Justice Community, State Water Resources Control Board, Aqua, AWWA, are all the individual uh, organizations which need, uh, need to be brought on board. There was a gross negligence on the part of the water community in not addressing the needs of the disadvantaged communities, and it's unfortunate. I was suggested and for a short while Aqua was involved in trying to work with the um, along the border of Mexico and there was NAFTA money that effort died. It's a cultural issue. The current board of and leadership at Aqua to, uh, gave direction to um, their general manager or executive director that this was be a priority for Aqua. As a result, um, Cindy Tuck, their legislative analyst, has been charged with trying to bring the water agencies on board. The well group is an example of that. Um, <coughs> to have allowed to go this far without response by the water community was a excuse me. I support this letter. It's something that we need to address. My concern had always has always been we also have low income and disadvantaged customers in our district. A general type of assessment would involve them also paying to help another disadvantaged community somewhere in the Central Valley. That just doesn't seem to be quite fair to me. So using general fund money and greenhouse gas funds actually makes a lot of sense to me. And I am also concerned about the state spending the money wisely because I believe I read a newspaper article about a say well that the state put in <coughs> to help a disadvantaged community somewhere near Fresno that is not being used and the residents are still trucking water because there are disagreements between local agencies about who should operate that particular well. So all I get to say is I know we have language in there about targets and implementable and sustainable, but fingers crossed. With that, I think you have our thoughts. Would you like to move on to the next item? Thank you. That's what I needed. Thank you. So uh, item 6.4.2. I uh, just wanted to quickly brief the board on Governor Brown's Executive Order B3716 uh, that modifies the state's current emergency water restrictions and establishes a course for the long-term water use efficiency objectives of the state. Um, just to summarize, among other things, the governor, governor's order does in the short term, it directs the state water board to update the current emergency regulations. It uh, continues the current mandatory and end-user prohibitions of water. 
and the state board is going to allow local water agencies to do sort of a self-certification. Uh, essentially, uh, what they are going to be doing is saying, let's repeat 2013, 2014, 2015 with you starting your water supply situation where it is now. So assume the hydrological conditions kind of repeat. At the end of that period, um, what's your water supply situation look like? And if it's okay, great. If it's not okay, um, then what kind of demand reduction response are you looking for to make it okay? And that's the exercise that staff is um, evaluating right now. In the long term, it directs the Department of Water Resources in con coordination with the state board to build on the state's SB 7x7, 20 by 2020 law uh, requirements. So th the question has been out there, what happens after 20 by 2020, after 2020? We're almost there. And uh, it, it directs DWR to address that. It uh, also uh, directs uh, uh, minimizing water system leaks that waste large amounts of water through legislation. The deadline for that <coughs> is uncertain. And uh, it also develops agricultural efficiency targets in the long term to be developed um, in coordination with CDFA. Um, it also asks the State Board to develop permanent water use reporting and end use restrictions. So obviously there's a lot of stuff for the staff to um, digest and consider. Um, the State Board, their regulations in terms of uh, addressing the short-term requirements are set for consideration on May 18th. And ACWD is participating in that process through our involvement with California Urban Water Agencies, CUA. Um, just as an aside, we see the governor's ruling as being good news, actually, because it looks like ACWD's efforts through CUA on a long-term water use efficiency uh, and the emergency regs are starting to pay off. Um, in fact, Felicia Marcus reached out to CUA staff and gave a heads-up preview of what the governor's order was going to be, and as a result, ACWD s staff received very timely information um, from CUA. Um, the short story is the State Board and DWR seem to have heard us. The governor directing DWR to take the lead on the long-term requirements is good, um, because DWR will do that in a more careful and methodical way. Um, and it essentially has the program elements that we've been recommending. Um, so district staff will carefully follow the state board's progress on the implementation of the governor's order and will provide timely information to the board of directors, both at the May 25th financial workshop and June 6th regular board meeting, to assist the board in determining whether it wishes to revisit or review any of our local conservation measures, which, uh, to refresh your memory, um, involves a water supply emergency ordinance and uh, also drought surcharges. So that is the plan. Thank you. Comments? Nope? None okay. for me. None for me. Well, the only, I would like to make one quick comment. Uh, uh, if it's coming from the governor at this point, I don't agree necessarily with everything. However, at this <laughs> point in time, I'm probably planning on writing in the governor's name for president. So I think I, I fully support it. Thank you. All right. With that, let's move on to director's common report. So item 7.1 is report from directors on the California Water Policy 25 conference in Davis. So which director attended and would you please report back to the <coughs> conference? Um, my report is real quick. I, this was my first time that I attended the California Water Policy Conference. I thought it was an exceptional conference. It was one of the uh, better conferences I've ever attended. Um, it did have a slant toward the environmental communities and uh, also um, a lot of the scientists that work in and around water and wastewater in the state. So I found it very um, educational for myself, 
and I will share more of my thoughts in, in committee meetings and things. The one exceptional, um, it was really an outstanding seminar uh, on uh, fishery restoration in California and uh, a lot of the progress that's being made, a lot of the obstacles that are still in place, uh, and there was a good discussions on what is going on in the Sacramento River, the Yuba River, uh, other rivers that, that flow into the Sacramento. But it also um, was very enlightening in terms of what the possibilities are for restoration in our own Alameda Creek. And I, I just found it uh, very, very insightful. Thank so that's my report on that conference. Thank you. Well, well, Director Wheat? I attended that same conference. Uh, it was excellent. It uh, was a different group. It was the University of California at Davis, so there was a um, university element there which gave it a different twist and uh, a different energy with the students. I had an opportunity to talk to Paul Landis, who's head of the California Water Commission, to whom we put in a request for the DAVAL proposal with uh, the chair of the cost of $150 million relocation of the East Bay Regional Park District facilities there, generating an extraordinary amount of water for us. Um, although I do know that the naive how seems how naive some of our students were when they so when they're making a presentation on the ability to develop a market and environmental um, issues. And I recall when we started this process, and maybe it's evolved, that the environment was priceless and therefore you couldn't put a dollar amount on environmental considerations under CEQA, et cetera. <laughs> but um, We'll see. Maybe common sense will prevail, and we've got a younger generation coming along, not burdened by the uh, folly of their forefathers and mothers. On that happy note, thank you. <laughs> so, item 7.2, report from directors on the Association of California Water Agencies Conference in Monterey, California. Any volunteers to go first? <coughs> I'll go first. Director Sethi. Okay, so... Um, I went through, uh, along with Director Weed, a um, retraining on AB 1234 ethics training, so I gave my certification to our district secretary. Um, I, I completed it last year, too. I wasn't obligated to complete it this year, but I learned so much from each one of those sessions, I decided that was a, a priority for me to attend. Um, number two, I attended the... Um, seminar on Thursday afternoon along with uh, uh, Mr. Stevenson on how to encourage millennials to enter the water industry and what are some of the prerequisites to uh, helping them along in their careers, what are their goals, and uh, it was very different from most of the kind of uh, uh, aqua seminars that have been held in the that I've attended in the past but I really like this uh, discussion about what it's going to take t to get the next generation of folks involved in the water industry uh, educate them on all of the uh, benefits of uh, and uh, interest uh, in, in being involved in this uh, um, part of the world so uh, I hope to share more of those thoughts from that discussion uh, as we move forward. But uh, for our Director of Human Resources, if you ever have a chance to sit in on one of those sessions, it, it's really very enlightening. Thank you, Thank Director you. Seppi. I think Director Kohler did not attend. Right? No, I did so not attend. Director Gunther? Well, very quickly, I, I went to a Delta Fix session um, a lot of repeat, but I did find it interesting to see Kern County, or an individual certainly very powerful in that area, going over the same thing we are, the budget case scenario, does it work? And it's fascinating to see those guys, it's a little scary to see those guys up there, it's very scary to see them up there, but it's also reassuring to see that they're looking at the same things we are, not necessarily from the same perspective, but certainly the same concepts. Um, probably one of the more interesting sessions, uh, it, the conference wasn't as um, 
dis, or, uh, disheartening as the last few have been, uh, maybe because we've had some water this year. Uh, most of them come back, I'm very discouraged. Um, there was a, the Andromeda fish one, there, I went to that session and there's been some very interesting studies done, not that they have any real strong support in the agencies yet, I don't believe, but in regards to fish, California fish in particular, and varying water temperatures in their habitat. And the fact that they're finding that they found, and, and their study and how they did it was, was actually quite interesting. They actually went into the stream, they took the fish out, they used the stream water, they're watching how their metabolism was working, um, and they saw that, hey, California fish are different. They've adapted to being able to use, they've adapted to being reared in higher temperature waters. It makes a lot of sense if you really think about it. The studies and all of, uh, all seem to be targeted, I believe it was on Columbia River, if I'm not mistaken, which is significantly different than California. This is the first time I've ever heard of these studies. I've seen them. It'll be fascinating to see how these play out. There's a lot more data needed, but it's very interesting to see that somebody is actually really looking very seriously at California fish and their adaptation to where they live. And this could have a strong effect on where we are right here with our steelhead, because some of the species they've studied were steelhead. And they found that, like I said, California does have that. Um, the weight rate restructuring session, I kind of got in a little bit late, which is too bad because the guy I wanted to see, the one who had the real data, that's the guy I got in on the tail, <coughs> not the tail end, but I didn't see his whole presentation. And I would love to see his presentation because he had some studies up there of where, how people were dealing with rates, if I remember correctly, and the drought and where they're going to be soon. Dramatically different. Uh, the rest of it was kind of like fluff from a couple of districts, but his stuff was good. And if we can get all those charts, I think we really should. Um, the drought, the state, what the state was going to do with the drought emergency, I think uh, I went and our general manager was at that session, and he asked probably what was one of the most per pertinent questions. There were a few that were just up there expounding on their, their, their thoughts. His question was something to the effect, and he can count, was what time are they going to make the announcement? And it brought it all home to anybody who is really looking at this is, why was that important? And he said, because that's when the news vans are going to show up in front of our office. <laughs> they didn't have an answer. <laughs> but I think it brought home to everybody that this is personal. People in that room are going to be affected by what he says, and the effect is going to be far different than a lot of people think. It's going to be a news van, possibly a microphone, a public member with a question. It's important what they say. Um, the marketing and water, I went to that, very fascinating, and that probably not a whole lot there. A couple of millennials, uh, not quite millennials up there, uh, who probably were maybe 10 years old if they were lucky um, 20 years ago um, discussing marketing water. But they left out and they kind of, they finally got to it, but their, their discussions did not include conveyance. They just talked about if we have water, what can we do with it and how can we market it? They did tap, they did target on it. Lester Snow was there, and in addition to the two other guys, they probably could have added up almost to his age. Uh, <laughs> certainly his experience was probably how old they were. Um, these guys have fascinating ideas. But finally, at some point, I remember a guy from the north, I don't remember what district he was from, but he stood up and he was talking about how he wanted to market water. Apparently, they must have some excess water, certainly being in the north. And I remember, I wish I had, a, I had a tape recorder and a camera. But when this guy looked at them and he said, you mean to tell me I have to support the twin tunnels? 
because they told him, it's fine. You got all this water, but there's one problem. You can't get it there, including this year. Even if you had it, right now, with the conditions we have, you couldn't sell your water if you wanted to because you can't get it there. And I think that really, to me, brought home a lot of the Twin Tunnels discussion was this guy, he didn't come away convinced, but he came away shocked in that, no, the Twin Tunnels affect him. It's not just sending water to Metropolitan. It was if you want to wield, wield water, you better work out the conveyance system, something we may want to look at. Um, the two lunch speakers, uh, fascinating. I don't know how much it really uh, maybe affects us at the national level as to why what happened occurred. But when we're talking about it was Donald Trump is, he, I'm trying to remember what he used, that. He's, a, um, he's a celebrity. In some ways, so is Hillary Clinton. They're celebrities. Why do they get what they get? Because they're celebrities. And it may be, it, it doesn't restore my faith in what's happening. I'm still terrified. But at least I could kind of put some reasoning as to why this is going on. Um, I, I wish we could, it would great, it would make great television, of course it will never happen, what he, what he said up there. He's a political pundit. Um, I always find them very interesting. The Taylor Farms guy, he was fascinating. He got up there and, and he, he basically explained why he didn't belong there and, and then he basically brought it all home and that there was a award ceremony over in San Francisco, the Goldman Award, if I remember correctly. And there were something like, what, 2,000 people in the room, and none of them are friendly to California water. And they're all very, very high-level people. And he said they don't support the farmers, and the farmers have been fighting among each other. And they've stopped, they haven't really stopped, but they've established this uh, center down there. Taylor Farms is putting some money into it as to, to kind of maybe, if you can't fight them, I wish I could remember the definition of, what was it, the definition of crazy is that you continue to fight the, the, same, same, thing, thing the same thing over and over again. Are we crazy? Because we continue to do that, and that was his point. And they've got, he's trying to rally the farmers in some degree of, of uh, um, acceptance, is that you can't keep arguing. You're not going to win, so why keep arguing? you got to morph. you got to compromise. And that's what they're doing. And we're going to be in the same boat. So anyway, with that, I'll let it go. It's a long night. Director Wheat. Director Wheat. Um, I am the representative of the board to the Joint Power Insurance Agency of the Aqua, and so I went down the first two days. Um, at a luncheon, the Region 9 FEMA director spoke. That was actually as a result of a suggestion I had made that we needed to look at the issues, what to do in a contingency environment. Afterwards, in the discussion, he indicated that his agency had data on the 500-year floodplain, which is would tie into the not floodplain, um, the 500-year yes, flood uh, situation and where the water levels would be. That would tie to the Obama's executive order of January 15th of last year. We talked about sea level uh, rise of several feet and critical facility protections for 500-year floods. So or just to <coughs> check that off and come up with each some data points. Alameda County Flood Control has not developed those criteria. Central Basin, a water district, large water district in Southern California, Los Angeles area, was kicked out of the organization um, on a fairly close vote. We have a number of ethical issues and we have uh, Mr. Calderon was one part of that problem and it expanded throughout the organization. Um, on 
Previously, Rio Linda had been an organization that was in trouble. They put them on probation. Central Basin? Gone. They may come back. Uh, um, on the Aqua Conference itself, staff, uh, obviously we have staff to go there. It's great to be able to wake up in the morning, start off at 8 o'clock and talk about water continuously <laughs> until 9 or 10 o'clock at night for some of us. I will talk about other issues. And I did have a chance to promote the concept proposal for part of the $2.7 billion on the Proposition 1 funds related to Del Val and the, uh, and the Bay Area Regional Reliability um, Consultant. Thank you. Thank you. So since we still have quite a few sessions, closed session in front of us, I'll make Madam this. Madam President. Oh. Yes, yeah, sir. I got, I got two items I'd like to bring to the public. Um, let me finish my aqua report, oh, then I'll oh, come yes. back. Is that yeah, okay? That's what we need to do. Okay. So back onto my aqua reporting, I'll focus on something that's different. I said in a lot of similar sessions on water fix, on water marketing. I said in a session on messaging, on how to get support on your water rate increase. <laughs> that's kind of interesting. But I think the focus is that we have to be transparent. We have to make our information easily accessible and make the message simple. I think that might be part of our problem as a district is that our message is a little bit too complex because we have multiple water sources and to justify our cost, it is very hard to say this is why and give it in one sentence. So that's something we could strive to do. Um, and then of course they encourage communication. Another session I set in was exploring utility charge affordability and actually a gentleman from a rating was there, that, that he has some interesting tidbits. Basically, in determining our rating is based on our willingness to raise rate to cover our costs, and they actually look at Prop 218 protests. They actually would count the no votes as part of the evaluation because I guess that would focus into his calculation in terms of the board's ability to raise rates. So that, that was an interesting tidbit. And they did have an example of a utility that managed to have a very good um, senior low-income assistance program. I was very jealous because their case is really unique. They actually have too much money and not enough people apply. <laughs> so they are mm. actually raising their criteria. But here's the kicker. We could not do what they do. So this was City of Sacramento. What the city did is they charged the utility a tax. The tax was protested, went to the ballot, the voter actually supported it. So suddenly that mm. water rate revenue changed color and become general fund money. So that's how they pay for the program and how they end up with so much money that they can't spend, that they actually have to widen the assistance criteria. You know, at first I heard there's actually a district that's successfully implementing this program until I heard that they actually have general fund money, then I kind of stopped. So unfortunately, it's not an example we can use. So with that, I think I'll just finish up my reporting. And going down the from the end, any <coughs> other directors' comments? Agenda you want to start with me? I just oh. have two additional items to report ahead, on. <coughs> on Tuesday of this week, I attended the uh, Fremont Chamber of Commerce uh, Leadership Fremont Graduation Luncheon. And uh, the district had an employee, Lawrence Herrera, who graduated. Um, so it was very delightful to be there. And uh, uh, ACWD is a sponsor of Leadership Fremont. Uh, so we were recognized a number of times. And uh, people respect the fact that we're involved. This is a nine-month program that uh, um, uh, I call them students go through. Um, and it's very educational in terms of uh, uh, allowing them to learn about how the community works and functions and from all different respects. Uh, and, and it was, it was uh, truly a nice lunch, and I uh, uh, want to congratulate Lawrence Herrera uh, as being the first person from our finance department. She's a senior accountant uh, graduating from the program. We have two other... Uh, graduates that were here tonight, Thomas Nizar and, and Shireen Gonzalez as well. So I hope we continue with uh, another person entering the program. Uh, yesterday I attended 
uh, the Alameda County Special Districts Association meeting up at the East Bay Regional Parks District headquarters near Nolan Park Zoo. And um, <clears throat> there were a lot of uh, things covered in two hours, so I'm not going to cover it all here, uh, especially some of the more detailed legislative things that are going on. But I will note two things. One, uh, there was a very, very good presentation from the San Francisco Restoration Commission on uh, sea level rise. And the damage, they were showing actual pictures of the damage from around the Bay Area uh, uh, that's been caused by current sea level rise. And most of this occurs during storms when we have uh, high tide levels. So they were showing levees, uh, roads, uh, all kinds of things that are close to the bay that have actually deteriorated and now will cost millions of dollars to uh, restore. Um, here's the good news and uh, for the community to be aware of. Uh, and this was all related to Measure AA that's coming up for a vote this June. <coughs> um, the encouraging news is that the amount of wetlands that we had around the Bay Area uh, was had gone down from around 250,000 acres in uh, 1850 down to about 25 to 40,000 acres. Um, in 1998, that was restored back up to 44,000. Over the last uh, 18 years, that now has brought us back up to 80,000, almost double. And they're looking with the new funds that come in from Measure AA to increase it to about 100,000. And the importance of the wetlands, as it was pointed out, is that the wetlands act as a sponge when we have storms. And that this is actually a protection for uh, the Bay Area, uh, protection against sea level rise in the future. So it's a very interesting discussion on that, on that matter. The second thing I wanted to do is um, point out that uh, Director John Sutter uh, from East Bay Regional Parks has announced that he's retiring, and he gave an impromptu presentation yesterday on his career. It was not on the agenda, but he is concluding 60 years of public service that he started in 1954 as a deputy district attorney, uh, lifelong resident of Oakland, and uh, he was later a superior court judge um, and has was part of Save the Bay uh, on the original commission for that. Just an extraordinary career. Uh, and he shared with us his, his slight disappointment that when he goes out to graduating uh, classes from local colleges and universities, that he doesn't find the same um, excitement about being involved in in civic life and uh, and how rewarding it has been in his life and just to close he mentioned that his his wife has described his life as being one meeting after another for the last 60 years but uh, the accomplishments of this man if you have a chance to look it up just absolutely extraordinary thank you director Kohler uh, yes um, we all got an email from our general manager last week that Monday evening, last Monday evening, Union Sanitary District was going to review a possible water reclamation uh, concept. And so I notified the, our general manager that I'd like to sit in and hear what they had to say. Um, they're looking at a, a package plant that they're going to put in uh, that would produce 40,000 gallons of uh, reclaimed water to uh, a, a filling station that would be built at the plant. And uh, uh, they'd be able to provide that 40,000 gallons to the Tri-City area on a annual, uh, daily basis. Um, now, the cost would be, the basic cost is $193,000 a year. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of questions that were brought up on uh, transporting this reclaimed water and what uh, Dublin San Ramon has 
experienced with uh, uh, the, the type of service. Uh, it was brought up that the, uh, there was traffic backed up even on the freeway for people trying to get into the Dublin San Ramon uh, treatment plant to get the reclaimed water. And they're not too sure how the city of Union City would take on this added traffic in a very limited area where Union Sanitary District is located. So there's a lot of questions. So this was an information only uh, session. They were looking at seriously at looking at option number three, which was that cost factor that I brought, I brought up. Um, they may hold it off because of the, the, the wet year we just had. I don't know if they'll execute the project this spring or this summer. It, it's up to the board what, what they want to do. Um, then I had a request from the uh, people in Fremont. They would like to uh, see a public relations effort to uh, champion our water quality that we do provide here for uh, the Tri-City area and do a, a PR program on a, who's providing our our testing for our water quality, our staff, uh, have a, a tour of our lab, it was a suggestion. Um, and, uh, you know, where do we get our, our samples to test our water and, and have a, a, a presentation uh, on water sampling, what, you know, how, how do we execute the water sampling um, and provide a, a, a future tour of the of the plant lab and, and the people that do this. It would be a great uh, presentation for the, for the community that they don't understand, you know, what goes into uh, what it takes and what, it, what the cost is to provide uh, high water quality to the Tri-City area. Um, so this was a suggestion that I would like to see the board think about in the future that, that maybe we would uh, like to propose some type of a event, a PR event. Um, but um, I thought it was, you know, there's so much talk about water quality in, in the media today that this, this was brought to me a number of times in the last two weeks. Um, and I, th I thought it would be a good idea to uh, Thank you, consider it. Thank you, Director Kohler. Director Gunther? I really don't have a lot tonight. This is more procedural. Um, I, as tonight's the first one we're actually recording, my question is, is and it's kind of redundant, but uh, is there going to be a copy of the um, agenda as published in along with this video? Because, I mean, we have an incredible amount of very fascinating graphs near the end, you know, uh, hardness graph uh, that we didn't really uh, discuss, plus the items that were, of course, the items that were uh, um, consented. A um, lot of valuable information that we may want to include. I don't know how to do it, just a thought. But particularly the, the, you know, the rainfall reports are here we didn't talk about, the wells. Mm -hmm. Just uh, something to think about as to how can we maybe integrate that. I mean, granted, it's probably somewhere. But if they take the time to actually look at this video, it would be nice if we could maybe kind of integrate that in somehow. What I think uh, what we're going to do is we already published the entire board packet mm -hmm. and then uh, we published the presentation slides on our website and if I'm not mistaken what you'll be able to do is go to our website and there'll be a little video link next to that packet so that you can watch the board meeting itself. So everything should be available um, for anybody who is interested, uh, okay. right in the same location. Mm. Thank you, Director Gunther. That's all I have. Director Lee. I comment on a meeting I attended earlier today at the Santa Clara uh, Valley Water District offices. They had a dis uh, presentation by um, some sanitary districts on the Oraloma project, which is a echo tone or a levy, a horizontal levy, and also called a laid-back levy. But it's a methodology for uh, building a, 
of the shallow slope levee <coughs> maintains a habitat. <coughs> the benefit to sewer and water districts is that it would address the ability to do discharge permits because the discharge is then used to uh, maintain the landscaping um, on the levees. Mm. What was fascinating and really a paradigm shift in the community where you had a number of environmentalists there that were discussing what is really in truth a massive Bayfield project. That included Save the Bay. Rather than worrying about the, uh, putting any fill in the bay, decreasing its size, now they're worried about the bay growing, with sea level rise, and um, the need to develop some type of an environmentally sensitive um, levee system. The initial projects, they invited, identified up to 200 million cubic yards of fill, and I believe it'll be in multiples of that. We were talking about adaptation, not mitigation. Um, you had a buy-in from a large number of people. They were looking at you know, prioritizing this as part of the measure of AA funds, which are going to be $12 per year per parcel, raising as much as $500 million uh, for uh, an annual contribution to the system. And it takes the entire discussion of all 50 years of protecting the Bay from any encroachment or development on its head, and now looking at the necess needs to adapt to it, and as you pointed out, the destruction. It is truly a change in mindset. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, then let's move on to item A, closed session. We have multiple closed sessions today, so it's what, now it's 8.59, 9 o'clock? So item 8.1 will be pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957.6, Conference with neighbor le uh, Labor Negotiators, Agency Designated Representatives are Robert Shaver, Jennifer Rogers, and Glenn Berkheimer. The employee organization will be the Alameda County Water District Operators Association. Item 8.2 is Conference with Legal Counsel, Anticipated Litigation, Significant exposure to litigation pursuant to California Government Code Section 54956.9D2. And there's one case. Item 8.3 is pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957, Public Employee Performance Evaluation, General Manager. With that, that's adjourned to closed session at exactly 9 o'clock on my clock. Okay. To legal counsel. On item 8.3, the board provided feedback and evaluation to the general manager. With that, let's move on to item 9.1. Do I have a motion to appoint, to nominate someone as the designated representative negotiator for general managers? I nominate uh, our current president, Judy Wong, and the vice president, John Weed, for the, to be the negotiators for our general managers. I'll second. Well, since the district secretary is not here, I'll call the rope. Director Seppi. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Director Gunther. Aye. Director Weed. Aye. Me, Director Wong. Aye. Just to be clear, that's they just appointed. Um, you just took action to appoint Point a labor negotiator for be, between the district and the general manager, who is an unrepresented employee for purposes of, of possible amendment to the general manager. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Pat. Thank you for the <laughs> clarification. With that, we have another closed session for item 10.1 is pursuant to California Government Code section 54957.6. Conference with labor negotiators. The agency designated re representatives are Judy Huang and Zhang Wei, and the unrepresented employee is the general manager. With that, we'll adjourn to a closed session at 11:05. First pillar of our community. All right. With that, I'll call the meeting adjourned. <laughs>